good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for showing up, especially today. I heard there is a match, cricket match between India and Pakistan. And, uh, and, and to leave that match and come here to this dialogue is really very, <laughs> it's a big compliment. Uh, so let's start. I will, uh, I have put thoughts on slides because that way we can go very quickly through them. I'm switching my share screen on. Uh, so we can do this. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. I hope everyone can see yes, my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me let's 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 start quickly. As all of you know, today's topic is uh, seventy-five years after the partition. It's a milestone in anyone's life, any nation's life. Uh, so we will, as the as the title says, what is what was it meant to be, and what has it become, and where it is going. So we our thought really is to put more focus on what it is and what it should be, in fact. And, and try to put that in a bit in a historical perspective, but we should really not dwell too much into the into the historical facts or, or misinformation or information. Uh, before I go further on the topic, uh, uh, I would like really to, or we, uh, OPP, would like to dedicate uh, today's program uh, to, to all the millions of victims uh, during the partition who sacrificed their lives, lost their loved ones, their homes, their everything for a better future. And, uh, and also, uh, as uh, uh, Rajmohanji said in the beginning, that the floods in Pakistan, we also, our hearts really go to all the flood victims and uh, uh, to the people who, are, who have enormous sufferings because of the flood. Uh, Partition, as someone said, had a widespread psychological impact, which may never be fully recognized or traced. And it is absolutely true because having been through this kind of situations or some of them even worse uh, and, and hundreds and thousands of them, uh, if, we, if you have gone through this, these kinds of situation, you have traumas which last a lifetime and which actually are passed on to the next generation. So no wonder that uh, uh, and I would like to fast, fast forward quickly and uh, come to uh, this uh, quote from a, from a newspaper. Uh, Prompt and drastic measures are necessary to save Pakistan from virtual bankruptcy. But our rulers seem to be content with obtaining foreign gifts to feed the people and relying on heavier doses of foreign aid for maintaining some, uh, some semblance of uh, continued uh, economic development. Now, this, uh, this quote in a newspaper could have been yesterday, last week, last month, or last year. Uh, it's anybody's guess when this, uh, this, when this thing appeared, actually. So if uh, I go to the next slide, now next, not this one. You see, this appeared in Pakistan Times editorial marking the 11th anniversary of independence in 1958. So we are, what, 64 years or whatever uh, further. And if you look at it, nothing really has changed. Uh, this could, be, could have been said yesterday. Now, but what also has been, is being told or said to, uh, told us uh, or, or said to us for last 75 years Every single year, year in, year out, we hear exactly like it is the recording of the same statements. And that narrative is uh, something like, I have put on a few examples, the country is going through uh, unprecedented crisis, mulka bura hale, security is at risk, foreign reserves are lowest, situation is worse than last year, Islam is under threat, sabpishli hukumat ka khubo hai, sazish ho rahi hai, or sare jo hamare opponents hain kafir hain gaddar hain and so on and so forth so this has been fed to us for 75 years this and similar statements repeatedly so this has become like everyone's uh, more or less uh, mindset uh, now the question really today to us is do we want to continue this narrative for next 75 years or do we need to build a new narrative uh, on side of india uh, India was uh, really a role model for many, many years for many countries, 
uh, for secular democracy. And really countries looked at it with envy that, uh, wow, it, it, the democracy could, be, could flourish this way. But unfortunately, the populism and extremism are on the rise. Uh, we have seen secularism recently coming under tremendous threat, and there are even demands from some groups to remove the word secularism from the constitution. And this has led to resumption of discussions on both sides of the borders, whether two nation theory was relevant, was right, was wrong, see it is proven correct, and so on and so forth. Violence against minorities, press freedom, uh, neoliberalism creeping in. So we are seeing these kinds of situations evolving uh, in, in that country. Uh, the, the, our today's really uh, purpose here is not to tell each other what their problems are and how to solve them, but what we want to do really today is find the common grounds, not uh, what's wrong. Each country is responsible for their own problems, but I think what we can do is plant a tree together, according to this Chinese proverb. It says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And we regret lots of these 20 years, lots of opportunities we, we lost in the past, and we regret them now. So let's not regret today's opportunity after 20 years, but I think let's uh, uh, try to do try to plant a tree together, as it says. Uh, having said that, I would like to introduce our panelists. And as a lot of you heard me saying uh, before the session, uh, it is really an absolutely fantastic uh, uh, panel. Uh, it's the best we could have ever wished for. And, uh, and we are extremely grateful for all these four people who are literally an icon in their own field. Actually, introducing them is also a, a tough job because they have reached a phase in life where introduction actually uh, is meaningless. But nevertheless, uh, they are here and uh, I would like to say a few words. And believe me, the introduction I wrote first was about three times as long as this. But then we said, my goodness, I mean, I'm doing an injustice to it, but let's keep on, <laughs> keep to the, to the minimum possible. So Dr. Harshmander, first one, I'm going with the alphabetic order with the first name. Uh, he is an Indian author, columnist, researcher, teacher, and social activist. He started the Caravan and Mohabbat campaign in solidarity with the victims of communal or religious motivated violence. He served as a special commissioner to the Supreme Court in the Right to Food campaign, a founding member of the National Campaign for the People's Right to Information. He was a member of the core groups on bonded labor and mental hospitals of the statutory National Human Rights Commission of India, as I said, he did his PhD from Fry Uni Universität in Amsterdam, which is actually our home base uh, of, of uh, OPP in the Netherlands. He convened the working groups on the Food Security Bill, Land Acquisition and Rehabilitation Bill, Child Labor Abolition, Urban Poverty and Homelessness, Bonded Labor, Street Vendors. He co-convened the groups on the Communal and Targeted Violence Bill. I mean, if you see, wow, uh, the kind of uh, activism here packed together in one person. Dr. Mandir's publications include Between Memory and Forgetting, Massacre and, and the Moody Years in Gujarat, Partitions of the Heart, Unmaking the Idea of India. And I will really, really recommend all of you to see this uh, introductions a bit more in detail on internet or on their websites and Facebook pages. The Peace Research Institute Oslo has included him in its 2022 shortlist of people recommended for the Nobel Peace Prize. Welcome, Dr. Harsh. Uh, welcome, uh, Harsh Bhai, I said I will call you. So welcome, Harsh Bhai. Uh, Dr. Ishtiak, uh, after H, we have I. He's a Swedish political scientist and author of Pakistani descent. He obtained his PhD in, in political science. <clears throat> Uh, from Stockholm University, where he is currently Professor Emeritus. During 15 to 2015 to 19, he was visiting professor at the Government College University, Lahore, and from 13 to 15, visiting professor at the Lahore University of Management Sciences, generally known as LUMS, an honorary senior fellow of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. He's visiting research professor at the Institute of South Asian Studies, author of several books, and I have 
the I have I mean every book is worth reading, but I have mentioned there are three which which I absolutely adore. Uh, it's Punjab Bloodied, Pakistan, the Garrison Estate, and the latest one, Jinnah, which has really turned people's uh, perceptions about many things upside down. So welcome, uh, Shtarbai. Uh, really, really thankful to have you. Uh, Parvez Hudbai, he, as I said, he has by in Urdu, it's, they always write Hudbai. So Dr. Parvez uh, Amir Ali Hudbai, one of Pakistan's most prominent academics, a well-known activist in particular concerned with the promotion of freedom of speech, secularism, education, and emancipation of women in Pakistan. He recently started this initiative in Islamabad called the Black Hole. And if you have time, just watch their programs. They are absolutely marvelous. He's author of Islam and Science, uh, and he has written many articles on various issues related to science and social issues in international media. By profession, he's a nuclear physicist, uh, but he talks like a political scientist. Uh, graduation with a double BSc in electrical engineering and mathematics, uh, and then followed by MS in physics. After graduation, he you, uh, joined the Qayyad Azam University in Islamabad as a researcher and renewed his scholarship to resume his studies in the United States. He continued his research in doctoral studies in physics at MIT and was awarded Nuclear Physics Award in uh, 1978. Last but not least, he has just written a new book, which is coming out uh, in December, and it's titled Pakistan Origin, Identity, Future, with, uh, and it will come in. And uh, Parvez Hudbai, we really look forward to, to uh, having this book soon and reading it. Uh, then, Oh, 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 oh. Raj Mohanji or Raj Mohan Bhai, I should have actually started with you, but uh, but your name is with R. <laughs> so, so Dr. Raj Mohanji, or no, sorry, not Dr. Raj Mohanji is an Indian biographer, historian, and research professor at the Center of South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, University of Illinois. His book, A Biography of His Grandfather, Mahatma Gandhi, Mohandas, A True Story of a Man, His People and Empire, received the uh, biennial award from the Indian History Congress. His works include Ghaffar Khan, Nonviolent Bhasha of Pak Pashtuns, Revenge Reconciliation, Understanding South Asian History, uh, Eight Lives, A Study of the Hindu-Muslim Encounter, his book, Punjab is a historical account of undivided Punjab from the death of Aurangzeb to the partition. In 2004, he received the International Humanitarian Award from the city of Champaign, Illinois. And in 1997, he was awarded an honorary doctorate of law from University of Calgary in Canada and an honorary doctorate of philosophy from Oberlin University, Tokyo. He serves as a jury member for the Nuremberg International Human Rights Award and co-chair of the Center for Dialogue and Reconciliation in Gurgaon. Raj Monji is associated with initiatives of change formerly known as moral rearmament. Uh, Raj Mohan Bhai, very, very honored uh, to have you today. Uh, what I'd like to do is, before we go into discussion, uh, I am now... Uh, Wahid Bhatti sahab, uh, may I interrupt you, the... please? I, sorry? May I interrupt you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just go to the um, first slides, if you want to, uh, to, to introduce OPP, because uh, you have missed that part before this. Oh, I did? Yeah, okay. please. Yeah. Can you oh, please? I started straight with the. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, please. I can, I can do that. No problem. And then we start with the speakers. Okay. Share a screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. A uh, quick introduction of uh, OPP. Uh, how could I miss that? Anyway, 
really briefly, uh, the purpose of the organization we started about six years ago in uh, from Amsterdam. Uh, OPP is a platform for the people of Pakistani origin, but not really restricted to Pakistani origin, to promote progressive values in a multicultural environment. And we have a full description of this on our website. Our vision is unity in diversity, and our mission statement reads, strive to elim eliminate exploitation and discrimination through meaningful dialogues. Uh, our inclinations politically, we believe in democracy, human rights, minority rights, gender equality, and we have no affiliation whatsoever with any political party. Uh, we believe in separation of state and religion, and we believe in inclusion, tolerance, acceptance, and harmony. So here with this, I will stop uh, uh, sharing the screen. And are we back to the normal screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, with this, I will really uh, request our panelists to go now in the reverse order and start with uh, Mohandas Bai to, to, to take five minutes to introduce the topic or frame it and say whatever his uh, candid thoughts are about it. And uh, let's keep it to five minutes because we will have plenty of time during the question answer session to, to hear your views elaborately. So uh, Mohandas, uh, Thank you, Wahid Bhai. Uh, I hope I'm being heard and I'm being seen. Yes. I, it's wonderful to be with uh, my fellow panelists, with the organizers of the OPP, and with all those who are uh, tuned in just now. I send my greetings to everybody. And of course, uh, very much in my mind and heart are the floods in Pakistan. And I hope I pray that uh, the uh, damage will be, as will be contained, and relief may come from all parts of the world. I absolutely agree that in, during this conversation, we should focus on the present and in the future. Uh, I will be ready to respond to any questions about the past, but the future is far more important. I want to start by acknowledging what was already mentioned uh, in, in the uh, introduction about the regression that has taken place in India in recent years. We have certainly gone back a great deal in India. And as was mentioned, uh, the two nation theory is back with a bang in India. There was a time when uh, many in India, the, last, the, the dominant um, opinion in India was that the two nation theory was something terrible that the Muslim League had introduced and India had nothing to do with it. Hindus had nothing to do with it. But today, in today's India, the two nation theory is back with a bang. The Hindus are one nation, the Muslims of India are another nation, and the Hindus are uh, superior, that they should be dominant. This is the theory now being believed and celebrated all across India. Um, Hindu supremacy has become dominant. Minorities have been intimidated, but the world does see India as a market and as a counterweight to China. So we should not expect that governments will put pressure on India. Yet the people of the world can put pressure. Also, even when an individual outside India of any origin, Pakistani, Indian, or from any other part of the world, expresses concern, anxiety, disappointment about what is happening in India. And this opinion is expressed in any form at a meeting or in any uh, form of media that does make an impact, small or large. So I want everyone to recognize this. I also want to mention one possibly hopeful fact that there is a contradiction that will eventually finish Hindu supremacy. What is this contradiction? The demand of the Hindu elite for supremacy in India absolutely clashes with the demand that Indians have for equal rights everywhere in the world, including the chance to be prime ministers or presidents of any nations, UK, US, anywhere. So we want equality in the world, but we want Hindu supremacy in India. This contradiction will eventually finish Hindu supremacy. Now, I don't know whether some of you saw this 
one of the best articles on Free India's 75th birthday, or the 75th year of partition, was uh, in the Indian Express by Vikram Patel, who's a professor of global health at Harvard Medical School. Now, Dr. Patel's father had spent his early years in Karachi, and he was one of the many millions uh, who 75 years ago moved to the other newly freed country. Uh, and Vikram Patel says that he has no lived memory of partition, but he recognizes that uh, his part of his identity lies in the other country. Part of his identity lies in Pakistan. And uh, now Karachi, which has more than 20 million people, with which Vikram Patel feels connected, is the capital of Sindh province. Before the 47 partition, about 1.5 million Hindus lived in Sindh. But today, in Sindh, 4.5 million Hindus live out of a total provincial population of around 50 million. So although there was this huge migration, it should be recognized that even today, or rather today, many more Hindus are living in Sindh than the Hindus who lived in Sindh during partition. This is something we should recognize and celebrate. Now, this Dr. Patel, who wrote this wonderful article. He dreams of a day when he says, we might all, the peoples of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, celebrate our independence together as one large family with no regrets. I think it's a fantastic vision he has. So just a couple of other points I want to make. Even if large scale joint celebrations are unlikely in the near future, small circles of friendship already exist in different parts of the world, where people of Bangladeshi, Pakistani, and Indian origin are able to refresh links that are bequeathed by history, by language, by cuisine, music. No visas are needed when Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis wish to meet, meet one another in Holland or UK, Europe, US, Canada, Australia, Japan. Uh, now also another po positive for the future is the growing global involvement of South Asians uh, uh, everywhere, in a number of countries. Now, COVID has underscored the great role played by healthcare professionals of South Asian Hello. origin. Did you? Lawyers, accountants, politicians of South Asian origins are also thriving. They and their counterparts in other professions are not likely in their new countries to settle for anything less than equal opportunities and rights. So this is a positive thing for the future. Another thing that I believe in is that the passions of hate and anger, which are at the moment uh, uh, strong in India and other parts of South Asia, but passions of hate and anger, in my belief, cannot continue for all time unless they are stoked by fresh incidents. However, prejudice and ignorance can last for generations, even if anger or hate does not last for generations. So this is where all of us can play our part, is to reduce and remove ignorance in Pakistan about India, in India about Pakistan, in Bangladesh about India and Pakistan, and so forth. And obviously, youth from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh uh, should meet one another much more than they do, get to know one another. And this is uh, one obvious point I want to make, that in many parts of the world, people of Pakistani, Indian, Bangladeshi origin live very close to one, one another. Uh, university towns and other big cities as professionals, but the, the interaction among them is really minimal. This is one area where all of us can do more. And of course, Hindustani or Urdu or Hindi is a very powerful force but we should enlarge the community and strengthen the community that speaks this language that both Indians and Pakistanis can easily understand and not always use too many Sanskrit, Arabic, or Farsi words. Uh, just uh, one last point I want to mention. Some of you may be aware that there is a movement among Punjabis, uh, uh, certainly in the Indian Punjab, and also I believe in Pakistani Punjab, to, re to remember old ties and to heal wounds. And uh, in Indian Punjab, uh, uh, the Akal Takht in Amritsar um, has agreed to organize or did organize prayers in August uh, this month, earlier this month, uh, for those who were killed in the partition of Punjab. 
so uh, from the Kal Tachat itself, there was this call for prayer for all those, not just the Sikhs, not just the Hindus, but for all those who were killed in 47. So this was a very important positive step. So I think I will stop with this, and I uh, am very glad to be with everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rajmohan Bhai. And I will now request uh, Parvez Udbhai Bhai to, to do the same, five minutes uh, to give an introduction. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Parvez Udbhai, uh, please unmute yourself. Am I unmuted now? Yep. Yeah, no, yeah. Okay. So while listening to Raj Mohanji and endorsing every word that he said, and in particular noting that the two nation theory is making a comeback in India, I started looking up the Pakistan penal code. And let me read out to you what I found. It says, Whoever within or without Pakistan with, in, with intent to influence or knowing it to be likely that he will influence any person or the whole or any section of the public in a manner likely to be prejudicial, prejudicial to the safety or ideology of Pakistan shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. <laughs> which means that in Pakistan, you cannot challenge the two nation theory legally because you will be imprisoned for 10 years or more and get a fine. Which is a bit strange because consider the fact that in 1971, the two nation theory was flushed down the drain. The Baigwali said they don't want to live with uh, East Pakistan, with West Pakistan. And that should have been the end of the two nation theory. After all, the two nation theory, as was espoused by Muhammad Ali Jinnah in his 1940 speech in Lahore before the Muslim League uh, uh, annual meeting, he said, there are only two peoples who live on the Indian subcontinent. There are Muslims and there are Hindus and they are different in, their, in what they eat how they think their heroes are different, etc., etc., and that they cannot ever live in peace. He did assume that all Muslims could live in peace together, and that in fact turned out to be that turned out to be wrong. It turned out to be something that the Bengalis refused to believe, and now more and more of Pakistan refuses to believe in the two nation theory. And so therefore, 10 years imprisonment or not, a lot of people are saying, it's time to rethink Pakistan. If Pakistan is to ever get out of the situation it is in, and uh, Wahid Bhai, very, um, I think the slides he put up were very evocative. They show a nation that is that is struggling now in every way. It has to go before the IMF so that it may survive the next few months and then it will go again after a few months because its geographic situation, because its, its, uh, its rental value has gone down because of the change in the geopolitical situation. Therefore, the United States is no longer willing to help it. The Chinese have helped it a lot, but they say there's a limit to that. And CPEC is foundering. It has pretty much come to a stop. And most of all, the Punjabi ruling establishment, which means the army and the two main parties today, both of which are Punjabi, one of them is the party of Imran Khan, PTI, and the other is the party of Nawaz Sharif and Shahbaz Sharif, PMLN. They are split, very, very badly split. And this is the first time in Pakistan's history that the ruling establishment has started to come apart. It has never happened before. 
even in 1971, when there was the crisis of East Pakistan, the Punjabi ruling establishment held together. Now that is no longer the case. And even as the floods go on, you see that Imran Khan is calling for more agitation and for more moves against the government while the government is responding with equal stupidity. And this shows the absolute lack of direction and the utter failure of the two nation theory. So 10 years in jail, I think a lot of people will be prepared to pay that, that penalty in favor of truth. Where lies the future of Pakistan then? I think it is time now to put the two nation theory to sleep. It is time to say that every citizen of Pakistan shall enjoy absolutely equal rights and privileges. And it is time to say that the people of Pakistan don't need an ideology. After all, there are lots of countries in the world that don't have an ideology. Many people today are living in, um, in the Netherlands. The many people in this um, Zoom meeting are living in the Netherlands. And I'd, like to, and I'd like to ask them, what is the ideology of the Netherlands? There isn't one. And so Pakistan now needs to make itself a normal state. A normal state doesn't have ideology. A normal state puts the welfare of its people above all else. It does not seek to, to improve the world as its very first priority. Instead, it seeks to give a better life to its people. It seeks to educate them and it seeks to have peace with its neighbors. This last point, having peace with neighbors, is particularly important for Pakistan. On the one border, we have Iran, and with Iran, Pakistan does not have good relations. In fact, the Iranians have been doing their part of the deal in trying to get their gas into Pakistan, but um, Pakistan has not uh, has not built the pipeline on its side, and there are no cordial relations between Pakistan and Iran. With Afghanistan, well, now that we have our government over there, we could have hoped for good relations there. After all, we spent 20, 25 years trying to get the, the Taliban into Kabul, and we did succeed. But now it turns out that Pakistan doesn't have good relations even with the Taliban. And the Tehrike Taliban Pakistan is by the day making inroads into Pakistan. And once you just leave Peshawar and you go to the other side of the hills, you see that the Pakistani authorities have fled. And then, of course, there's India. And India is the one that we have fought four wars with. And apart from the Bangladesh war, those three wars have been all about Kashmir. The way to proceed now on Kashmir is to simply accept the status quo, realize the fact that given that both countries well, are that's... nuclear armed, it is not possible for Pakistan to, to seize the part of Kashmir, which is under Indian control, and equally, India cannot seize the part of Pakistan, cannot seize the part of Kashmir that is under Pakistani control. And so the most important thing with regard to foreign relations, and perhaps the most important thing of all, is to recognize that Pakistan, in order to prosper, and in fact, even to survive, now needs to make peace with India, and it cannot do so unless it puts the issue of Kashmir on the back burner. Now, I do not propose that we look for a solution because there is no solution to Kashmir. I mean, pragmatically speaking, but what we can hope for, and if there is wisdom in Pakistani leaders, which I don't see, but which 
hopefully may come someday, then we should do what General Musharraf did. Not that I admire General Musharraf, but what Musharraf did was very, very sensible. He said, soften the line of control, let there be trade, let divided families cross over, decrease the tension, and then wait for some day to resolve these issues between India and Pakistan, and in particular, the matter of Kashmir. That, to my mind, is the way forward for Pakistan. I don't see any other. Okay. Thank Sorry you. if I've taken up too much no, time. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hudbay. Ishtiak uh, Bhai, would you like to say a few words? Sir, unmute yourself, please. Thank you very much. When I heard Parvez about this new law they have brought in, that there is a 10 years uh, imprisonment for anyone speaking against the two-nation theory, then I wonder, having smashed the two-nation theory in my Jinnah book, and my plans were to go to Pakistan in December and meet my friends. Is it worthwhile? Parvez, would you recommend that I take this journey or, or what should I do? <laughs> well, okay, because... wait, wait, wait. It's, it's, it's not new. It's been in the books for at least 25 years or so. So um, don't worry. I don't think they'll put you in prison for this. No, no. Come, come, I just, come. I was thinking that... <laughs> aaj aai, aaj aai, aaj aai. Bilkul. What I was thinking that if you make uh, stupidities, they become a cumulative process. So one after the other, these strange laws, Hadood laws was brought in. It is a popularly elected prime minister of Pakistan, Zulfkar Ali Bhutto, who brought in the requirement that not only the president, but also the prime minister has to be a Muslim and both have under oath to testify that they believe in the finality of the Prophet Hood of Prophet Muhammad. I mean, I think the problem is far more serious. The two nation theory is organically built into the whole notion of Muslims being a nation with their own culture, their own identity, their own laws. And I have quoted ad infinitum, Jinnah saying this and all others. But I'm not pessimistic because I think ultimately the wisdom is that of survival. Pakistan has, I think, hit, hit the rock bottom. There is no foreign patronage which can, you know, uh, uh, bail out Pakistan any, anymore. When uh, the partition took place, you know, 19, a, a bit of history we have to bring in. Otherwise, we, we tend to agree, all four of us, because we are socially engaged. We are politically informed. There is no other solution except what Pervez and Raj Mohan Bhai have already proposed. The thing is, the whole anatomy of the two-nation theory and its implementation was so incongruent. If now Muslims were a nation, which, as we all know, is very, very questionable. Not only that the Bengalis have uh, finally broken away and founded their own state, but within the so-called Muslim Ummah, you find Shia Sunni conflicts, even uh, uh, sectarian killings, you know, terrorism. The Sunni and uh, within the Sunni, the Brailvi and Diobandi and al Hadis are charging one another with heresy and so on. So this is the level at which Pakistan has arrived in terms of being an ideological state. I very strongly agree with Pervez, and this has been an argument I've given all along, that normal states after the founding of the United Nations, what was new about it? The new thing about it was that building empires and maintaining empires were over. There will be territorial states. Those territorial states will give equal rights to their citizens, and they would have good relations with the rest of the world, especially within the same region. But unlike the freedom of Asia and Africa, 
where it was directed against a foreign occupying power. When it came to the subcontinent, the Muslim League led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah broke away. And I'm not going to, into the history who was right, where, where the, what caused it and all that. We don't have the time. And instead of looking at the freedom uh, from the British, it became freedom from the Hindus. You know, this is what Jinnah said. And this was trumpeted all along. Uh, and finally, we got Pakistan. But there was a problem. There were minorities on both sides. And if we now, I was just thinking of how can we make sense of a secular India which had a constitution which is admirable. I even tell to my friends that the attainments of the Indian constitution are unique. It introduced reservations for the historically most oppressed sections of the people. And it was meant for all Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. But once you opt out of it, and it would never have been a peaceful uh, separation because property-wise, population-wise, village relationships, all were so well-connected. Even the trade routes were connected in a way that they could not be snapped simply because of a ge geographical line. So then Pakistan comes into being. And Pakistan then looks to foreign patrons to arm itself, to get economic aid. And that story is the beginning of not only the wars which Pakistan has fought, but also the debt which has been increasing all the time. I gave this example in my videos all the time that Actually, Pakistan was doing better than India in terms of the rate of growth. We had 5.3% uh, up until 1965. And India had this rather strange idea of a Hindu rate of growth, which was 2.7 or 2.9. But then this aid given by the World Bank was bent to promote India as an alternative, uh, Pakistan as an alternative to India, that capitalism works, socialism doesn't. But what does Pakistan do? It goes to war with India. So this ideological fixation that Pakistan is a state with a very special mission, it has got us into trouble into the Afghan Jihad. We got involved in this terrorism in the Indian administered Kashmir, now integrated into India. And we struck targets as far as Mumbai and Delhi and so on. As a reaction, I think, the two-nation theory, which, which for the Hindu majority of India was not the attractive proposition in 47. One after the, uh, the other, these experiences because of Pakistan's activities, the so-called non-state actors, resulted in finally the BJP becoming as much an upholder of the two-nation theory as Jinnah was and the Muslim League was. Now, the question is, we all know that this is a very, very bad situation. What can be done? I think Pervez rightly pointed out that the Kashmir issue can be put on the back burner. I would go even further. I would say that India and Pakistan psychologically need to understand the that the line of control is the international border, agree to it, and as Musharraf and Manmohan Singh and others agreed, this border can be made porous, people can start coming and going. I'm saying that 15 years idea doesn't work anymore after India has integrated its Kashmir into its own union, uh, you know, the way it is. So the day we accept that we are an independent nation called the Pakistanis, and there is an Indian nation, we have different religions, we have different sects, and so on. But these two states are there to stay. And one reason is, and I think Pervez would be angry with me, but honestly, since both are nuclear powers, nuclear armed powers, they can't go to a war. So terrorism is all right. Glacier, you know, Siachen and so on, they can do. But a major conflagration is out of the question. 
So on both sides, this wisdom exists already. I think we intellectuals, this is the first time that four of us are together. I Let's make it a network that we talk about the need for peace, the culture, the language, the Bhangra, and, and I don't know, I can keep on mentioning so many things. Pakistan and India, they're forever together. Environmentally, we need to cooperate. We need to cooperate in all reasonable, practical ways and trade with India, actually, the main beneficiary will be Pakistan. So I think I will end here. My five minutes probably are over. Uh, uh, peace with India, peace with all neighbors, trade with India, uh, and and all and these these steps will take us forward. Other otherwise, Pakistan is doomed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ishtarve. Thank you very much. Uh, definitely not uh, the least, but the last is uh, Harsh Bhai. Uh, would you like to uh, say a few words? Thank you. Uh, Professor Hush, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, India and Pakistan, one day freedom has been, as we recall, uh, amid rivers of blood. On both sides of the border, a million people killed each other. Uh, 15 million people were displaced forever from their homes. Among them was my own family uh, from Rawalpindi. The tragedy of this frenzy of violence was even more profound because India and Pakistan uniquely won their freedom through nonviolence. Um, this was the resolve never to hate or cause harm to the enemy that you fought. But now, as we look back 75 years, there are many wounds that are still to heal, many wounds that still need to be told, many lessons. Uh, as you know, as, as became so clear when we, I mean, I listened to my three brothers before me. Uh, so many lessons that remain unlearned. The most important is to understand that partition was um, the outcome of a battle between two ideas of how we should live together across different religions, languages, cultures. Um, we've spoken about the two nation theory, but I think that at its, at its core, the idea of Pakistan was the belief that we can secure safety, security, development, peace only if we are, live with people in a nation of sameness. And the sameness is founded on only one axis, and that is of religious faith. The idea of India, uh, which we have sort of uh, seemed to be uh, dismantling uh, perilously uh, every, every passing day. But the idea of India at its best was, no, we're not safe by seeking samenesses. We are safe only if we respect each other. We respect each other in the, in, in the practice of our faiths and our cultures and our languages. And we share, uh, you know, there is an ideology and that is the ideology of our constitution the ideas of equality, justice, fraternity, um, and freedom for all. It was a battle of these ideas that we see, we saw, uh, uh, and partition happened. Um, we've spoken about the grief of, of Pakistan. I think I'd like to just say uh, a couple of lines about my grief, about where my country has reached uh, 75 years after nation uh, of India's uh, of India's uh, uh, journey as a republic. In recent years, India is increasingly resembling a Hindu version of Zia's Pakistan. India under Modi seems committed to proving that Jinnah was right and Gandhi was wrong. And that is the tragedy of India today. Uh, there is, you know, there's, uh, you know, it's almost as if the state is at war with its own Muslim citizens. And, and the war takes many, many shapes. There's a political electoral part of the battle uh, against Muslims, which we see, uh, you know, there is today the BJP does not have a single, not a single member of a parliament 
or legislative assembly anywhere in the country who is of Muslim identity in a country with 200 million Muslim people. There is a social part of the battle where we are seeing lynching, uh, uh, hate violence. I have been on, you know, on 30 journeys in, in, the, in what we call the Karwani Muhabbat to the home of every person uh, uh, who has been lynched. And the stories are, you know, there is such an upsurge of hate. Uh, and uh, we, we go to them to say, uh, you are not alone. Uh, there are many people in India who care and stand with you. We seek forgiveness for what we have become. Um, we will stand with you in your battles for justice as you rebuild your life, and we will tell your story. Um, so I think that that uh, uh, that the battle 75 years ago, 100 years ago, and the battle today has never been a battle between Hindus and Muslims. It always is a battle between those who uh, who follow their faith and through that respect every other faith, uh, and between those who, uh, who misuse religion uh, uh, to create hatred against others. Um, it is interesting that uh, you know, the two people who spoke the most uh, for a religious state, uh, Jinnah Saab and uh, Mr. Savarkar, both, uh, Savarkar was a self-professed atheist uh, Mr. Jinnah was not a practicing Muslim much of his life. Uh, the two people who fought most and sacrificed the most uh, for the idea of a religious state, uh, of, of a secular state, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was a deeply devout Hindu and, uh, and Manan Azad uh, was a deeply devout Muslim. We, you know, we have to look to the future by, by, by looking back a little uh, uh, at, uh, at at what these leaders talk to us about. Um, Maulana Azad uh, said that I am uh, I'm Muslim and I am Indian. And both of these identities are intrinsic to me and neither should be separated from me. Uh, we, uh, uh, about Gandhi, there, there, there are many things to remember uh, as we look back to look forward. Um, but I, 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 I look back to Perhaps his most, uh, you know, I think the, the golden period of his life was uh, was when his heart was most broken, when uh, when the violence of partition happened. He went to uh, uh, famously uh, his fast in Nakoli and then in um, in uh, in Calcutta. And uh, you know, many stories are told. I just uh, you know recount one before I. Uh, before I close, uh, the story is told about uh, Gandhiji fasting and saying he won't eat uh, a morsel till every, every bit of violence in Calcutta ends. And a Hindu man comes to him very angry and throws a roti on his face and says, uh, you know, what you're doing is, is terribly wrong. Uh, you know, how do you expect me to forgive and to overcome my pain and anger? My little boy, this small, uh, was killed by Muslim mobs. How can I overcome my grief? And Gandhiji replies to him, I understand your grief, but if, if you really want to overcome it, I'll tell you a way. Find a little boy, this small, a Muslim boy whose parents were killed by Hindu mobs, and adopt this child as your own. Raise him like you would have raised your son, and raise him in his own faith. And maybe you'll find uh, places in your heart to to heal and to forgive. We need to we need really to go back to those fundamentals. I don't think they are lost in India uh, or in Pakistan. Uh, uh, you know, I took my mother back uh, when she turned seventy five. She left Pakistan uh, at partition when she was eighteen, and when I took her back, uh, uh, you know, to uh, to revisit the land of her birth. Sorry, I uh, I went to uh, you know we, we there were many things that happened, but we we went to Balmandi and Rawalpindi where she uh, we we tried to find her house, and we couldn't locate the house, and we almost gave up. And finally, she said, "No, no, I think that house could be mine." 
Uh, and I knocked on the door tentatively saying, I'm really sorry. Uh, a man opened the door and I said, I'm really sorry. My mother thinks this might have been her home. And without a moment's hesitation, uh, this man turns to my mother and says, Mata ji, aap kyun keh rahe hain ki aapka ghar tha? Ye aaj bhi aap hi ka ghar hai. Aap aaye. And it turned out to be her home. And for, for till, the, till she died, uh, those memories uh, never left her. Uh, the joy of seeing her home again. And when we were leaving, he said, uh, you know, you cannot leave this home. It is your home until I, I, I cook food for you and, and take care of you and so on. Um, we have to listen to our ordinary people. I think uh, we still, they recognize that we're still brothers and sisters. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, if you have to look to the future, my belief is that it is only through a recognition that uh, that it does not matter which God you worship or if you worship no God. It does not matter what language you speak, what, what your caste, your color, uh, nothing matters. Uh, uh, we are human beings. We share each other's uh, uh, joys. Uh, we share each other's pains. We sh uh, your injustice to you is is uh, is chains upon my feet. It is, you know, there is no other solution except to rebuild our societies on the foundations of fraternity. Both countries are at a moment where this looks terribly hard uh, to accomplish, but I am convinced uh, that uh, there's goodness and there's kindness uh, and uh, a belief in, 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 in the ideas of um, of of ultimately what fraternity is uh, among all our people. But we see in Saniyat mein hi hamara, uh, hamara future hai. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, Harshvai. That's a very moving story about your mother visiting her home. And you hear so many similar stories which are actually really painful. And at the same time, uh, very, very emotional and it gives you hope, gives you a lot of hope. Uh, Rana Saab, should we take now questions? Yeah, please, uh, we should take uh, questions now. And I've seen uh, some people have uh, raised their hands and some have uh, um, uh, placed their questions in the chat box as well. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, we encourage everybody to please uh, come up uh, and raise your hands and uh, then ask your question directly. Uh, in spite of, uh, you know, um, uh, okay, fine, it's okay uh, if you place your question in the chat, but it, it would be good. So, um, uh, may I take, take uh, first question from uh, Girish uh, Batra Sahab. Uh, he's from Bangalore. And then uh, later I would come to other. Uh, Girish Ji, please unmute yourself and uh, then ask your question. Yeah, I am unmuted. Uh, really, thanks for having this uh, session. And I thought I would Hindi and I would Punjabi. I would like to say that I would like to say YouTube videos. Because you both, Parvez Rukhbhai sahab and Istiyak Ahmed sahab, are rockstar in India. They are also rockstar in YouTube. Ke rock star hai. So really nice to be on the same forum. Mera... Batra, ji, Batra ji, can I make a request to everyone? Sorry to interrupt, but please keep your question as short as possible and on the topic sure. because we want to give everyone opportunity to ask questions. And thank sure. you very much. Thank you very sure. much. नहीं तो एक कमेंट ही है उसके बाद क्वेश्चन है कि बेसिकली गांधी मूवी हम सबने देखी है कि उसमें वो चड्डी पहन के लोगों ने ब्लैक फ्लैग दिखाए थे गांधी जी को कि भाई पार्टीशन करने सो कॉम्प्लिकेटेड है हिस्ट्री कॉम्प्लिकेटेड है उसको समझना या उसके डेप्थ में जाने में कुछ निकलता है फ्यूचर इज व्हाट वी शुड ऑल वर्क फॉर मेरा सवाल यही था हम सब क्या करें यहां बैठ के कि ये भाईचारा बढ़े मतलब जो भाईचारे की बात हमने की है हम सब क्या करें मैं बांग्लादेश पांच बार जा चुका हूं एंड आई डेंट फील दैट इट वाज अ डिफरेंट कंट्री मेरे जैसे ही लोग थे मेरी जैसी बातें कर रहे थे बिजनेस के लिए गया था मैं तो सेम मैं पाकिस्तान भी मेरा बिजनेस ट्रिप रह गया था आई डेंट कम रूट्स ऑफकोर्स आई एम अंधी सो रूट पाकिस्तान में है ही सो मे बी वही रीजन था कि मुझे आना था तो हम क्या करें उसके लिए मेरा एक आइडिया ही था ओवरसीज पाकिस्तान या इंडियन एसोसिएशन बना दीजिए इसको दैट्स द वन स्टेप हम सब कर सकते हैं और क्या करें हम सब के भाईचारा बढ़े फ्यूचर के लिए थैंक यू वेरी गुड Very good. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bataji. And uh, let me uh, take another uh, two questions. Uh, other two questions. Bagrab Reddy, sir, uh, can you can you please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? 
thank you very much for having me. Uh, this is Bhargav Reddy, formerly with Queen Mary University of London, currently working for a back assistance and risk consultancy based in Singapore. My question is more at a strategic level and primarily uh, directed towards Professor Hoodboy as well as uh, Professor Ishtiak Ahmed. Uh, could you please elaborate on the Kashmir front uh, when you mentioned that it wouldn't be possible to uh, regain the rest of Kashmir for either of the countries? Strategically, how feasible that is or unfeasible that is for either of the countries? Pardon me if I sound naive, but uh, I thought a, a fair amount of elaboration was valid here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let me take another question and then we uh, uh, go towards our speakers. Uh, uh, Sufyani uh, uh, Aftab, please. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, shukriya, sir. Uh, uh, sir, my question is that, sir, uh, sir, I'm living in the place, sir, it's called Aligarh, sir. And Aligarh, sir, uh, John Elias said John Elia said something about it. ये जो पाकिस्तान है ये अलीगढ़ के लॉन्डों की सरारत का नतीजा है सर ऐसे वक्त में सर जब हमारे सेशन हो रहे हैं सर जब हमारी इस वैसे पे बात हो रही है सर हमसे ठीक थोड़ी दूर जहां पर आ, मतलब कि पाकिस्तान बनाओ कमेटी की मी, आ, मीटिंग चलती थी अल्लामा इकबाल होते थे तमाम लोग होते थे सर ऐसे वक्त में सर मैं जिस जगह पर बैठा हूं वहां इस बात को लेकर के बीट लगाई जाती है फना जीतेंगे तो पार्टी देंगे फना जीतेंगे तो फना करेंगे ये सारी घटनाएं होती रहती है सर लेकिन सर एक घटना ही सर मैं सर बीए फर्स्ट ईयर का छात्र हूं सर स्टूडेंट हूं सर मैं ये पूछना चाहता हूं कि सर एक घटना जो अतीत में घट चुकी है जो पार्टिशन हो चुका है एक बीच में खाई आ चुकी है सर जो हमारे पूर्वजों की गलतियों की वजह से या और फिर या उनके इंटेलेक्चुअलिज्म की वजह से या उनकी दूरदृष्टि कौन की वजह से हो चुका है सर तो इस खाई में कौन से ऐसी मिट्टी डाली जाए कि वो खाई थोड़ी और कम हो जाए उसमें से ऐसा फूल लोगे जिससे तमाम तरह की हर तरह ऐसी खुशबू जाए मोहब्बत की खुशबू जाए और ये जो खामखा की लड़ाइयां होती रहती है ये जो एक नेशनल सो कॉल्ड नेशनलिज्म को लेकर के आपस में लड़ते रहते हैं चाहे वो सोशल मीडिया हो चाहे आपस में हो ऐसे हम जैसे युवाओं के लिए सर ऐसा कौन सा काम हम युवाओं को करना चाहिए और जिससे ये इन खाई को इसमें ऐसी मिट्टी डाली जा सके ताकि वो फूल उगे और तमाम तरह तमाम तरफ मोहब्बत की खुशबू जाए और ये सवाल सर मैं मूल रूप से इश्तिया अहमद सर से पूछना चाहता हूँ डायरेक्टली क्योंकि सर का काफी पॉलिटिकल साइंस का मैं स्टूडेंट हूँ सर का ताल्लुक रहा है बहुत शुक्रिया धन्यवाद सर थैंक यू या थैंक यू वेरी मच नाउ देयर वर थ्री क्वेश्चंस एंड आई वांट टू इनवाइट आवर रिस्पेक्टेड गेस्ट स्पीकर्स राजमोहन जी हरीश जी प्रवेश भाई और इश्तिया भाई प्लीज anyone ji uh, parvez bhai ha uh, uh, chali yes main koshish karta hu ek ye ke hindustan aur pakistan ke beech mein kis tarah se mafahamat ki jaye ke wo log jo europe mein rehte hain america mein rehte hain wo kya kar sakte hain main aapko ye bata sakta hu ke aaj se koi 30 40 saal pehle बहुत से इंडियंस पाकिस्तानी इकट्ठे होते थे विनोद मुबई जो इस वक्त मौजूद हैं वो आपको बताएंगे कि एम के आसपास कितने सारे इंडियंस और पाकिस्तानी होते थे जो मिलकर शामों को बैठते थे और दुनिया जहां की बातें करते थे और ख़ास तौर पर साउथ एशिया में अमन किस तरह से लाया जाए तो ये ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा करने की ज़रूरत है और जो तजवीज़ थी कि पाकिस्तान इंडिया का कोई जॉइंट फोरम बनाया जाए यूरोप में अमेरिका में जहां जहां मुमकिन हो सके ये एक अच्छी तजवीज़ है जहां तक कश्मीर का ताल्लुक है मैं समझता हूं कि ये बात बिल्कुल वाज है इश्तिया ने भी ये बात कही थी कि न्यूक्लियर वेपन्स के होते हुए अब तो ये नामुमकिन हो गया है कि पाकिस्तान इंडिया से कुछ ज़मीन छीने और इंडिया के लिए मुमकिन नहीं है कि वो पाकिस्तान से कुछ छीने अब तो एक स्टेटस को आ गया है इसको हम तोड़ इस जो जोग्राफियाई हदूद हैं ये रहेंगे इनको आप बदल नहीं सकते हाँ आप बेशक ऑपरेशन कोल्ड स्टार्ट जो आ, किसी इंडियन जनरल के सोच की इख्तरा थी वो वो आप बनाए लेकिन यू नो दैट न्यूक्लियर वेपन्स हैव मेड वॉर इम्पॉसिबल 
ये और बात है कि अब भी मैं न्यूक्लियर वेपन्स के बहुत खिलाफ हूं क्योंकि मैं समझता हूं कि वो हादसाती तौर पर एक्सीडेंटली इस्तेमाल हो सकते हैं और बहुत बेहतर होगा कि दोनों मुल्क अपने न्यूक्लियर वेपन्स खत्म कर दें चलिए वो नहीं होने वाला है लेकिन कम से कम कश्मीर में तो एक स्टेटस को है अब आप लोगों को आराम से आने जाने दीजिए जो लोग जुदा हो गए उनको आप तजारत शुरू कर दीजिए वगैरह वगैरह तो ये सारी बातें हैं जो हम कर सकते हैं जो अब करने की जरूरत है जी इशाक भाई मेरे ख्याल से प्रवेश भाई ने जो बात कर दी है वही पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू हमारा है हम महल चारों के ये है तो जो हम में से एक बोल दे महल वो सबके लिए बोल रहा है और ये जो यंग स्टूडेंट थे अपना अलीगढ़ से मुझे इनके समझ भी आती है ये लोग वहां पे रह गए हैं और अब वहां पे इन्हें सुबह शाम कहा जाता है कि अगर तुमने पाकिस्तान बनाना था तो फिर जाओ पाकिस्तान ये एक वो क्या कहते हैं झटका लॉजिक तो है ना और मुझे कई ऐसे अच्छे लोग भी मिले हैं कि जब हम वेस्ट पाकिस्तान से गए लुट कि तो उधर देखा तो वहां तो, तो मुसलमान थे सारे हिंदुस्तान में इंडिया वेस्ट पाकिस्तान में किसी मुसलमान को नहीं छोड़ा तो ये सेरा जो है महात्मा गांधी की कुर्बानी और जवाहरलाल नेहरू की प्राइम मिनिस्टरशिप और सरदार पटेल का भी एक्शन एज होम मिनिस्टर जिन्होंने हिंदू महासभा को शायद बैन किया था अगर हिंदुस्तान की वो हुकूमत एनलाइटेंड हुकूमत ये ना करती तो जिस तरह यहाँ से हिंदू नहीं थे जा रहे सिख भी नहीं थे जा रहे इनको मार मार के भगाया गया इनकी प्रॉपर्टी को छीना गया मेरी अगर आप पंजाब पार्टीशन किताब पढ़ लें तो उसके बाद ये मसला बिल्कुल क्लियर हो जाता है कि किसने क्या किया लेकिन अब ये बातें क्योंकि सोशल मीडिया आ गया है हमारा ये फोरम आ गया है और मैं देखता हूँ पाकिस्तानी इंडियन लड़के लड़कियां एक दूसरे से गुफ्तु कर रहे हैं तो वो जो पुरानी दीवारें थी वो अब इस तरह खड़ी नहीं रह सकती मैं एक आपको जल्दी से अपना एक्सपीरियंस बताऊं चार मार्च 2013 को मैं मेरी पंजाब की जो किताब है ना पार्टीशन वाली वो पब्लिश हुई थी इंडिया में तो मैं लेक्चर देता फिरता था तो गुरु नानक देव यूनिवर्सिटी में मेरा लेक्चर हुआ अब देखे है पंजाबी सारे वहां पे लेकिन उन्होंने कहा जी आप अंग्रेजी में बोलें तो मैंने अंग्रेजी में तकरीर कर दी सवाल जवाब हो गए फिर मैं नीचे स्टूडेंट्स के पास आ गया तो वो सब मेरे साथ आ गए और मैंने पंजाबी शुरू कर दी बोल ली तो मैंने देखा वो मेरी शक्ल की तरफ देखते जाएं फिर एक लड़की ने हिम्मत करके कहा सर तुसी तो बड़ी सोनी पंजाबी बोल दे सर यू स्पीक ब्यूटिफुल पंजाबी नाउ आई देन रियलाइज दे डोंट नो दैट a million uh, 100 million punjabis live just across the vaga border the curtains which have come down are not just this red cliff line but also complete lack of information about people on both sides i have seen wherever i go as soon as people speak gujarati and there is another gujarati they speak urdu everybody comes together hindustani bengalis are always getting together punjabis are always getting together without a problem so the problem is not in the people i have seen hindu and sikhs coming to lahore going to anarkali and the shopkeepers have said pan ji tusi aa gaye ho tade kol assi paise nahi lene you are our sister how can we take money from you so those people have been shocked ke hame to bataya jata hai ke every muslim believes in ghazwa e hind ye abhi mujhe kisi ne pucha hai aur main kya khuda ka khauf karo pakistan mein मोस्ट पीपल डोंट इवन नो द कलमा प्रॉपरली बेचारे आम से पैदा मुसलमानों के घर में हो गए उनके पास कोई इस किस्म की इंडोक्टिनेशन नहीं है दिस ऑल हैपन्स एट द लेवल ऑफ स्कूल एंड एट द लेवल ऑफ द स्टेट एंड लुक एट द पॉलिटिशियंस यू नो वी थॉट के इमरान खान इज सेंग नो ट्रेड विथ इंडिया एज सुन एज द्यू गवर्नमेंट हैज कम दे टेक द आइडेंटिकल पोजिशन सो द लाइट इज नॉट to be sought among these decadent corrupt politicians but we have to as has been a, you know we have discussed bring in the best minds the intellectuals together and then i think there is a hope i i've never given up the hope because i know this is all so artificial people want to meet they want to be friends and they want to do trade this is also true thank you very much but i might add uh, yes 
Sure. Yeah, please, Arj. Arj, why? I, I wanted to respond uh, especially to uh, the young young uh, Sufyan Aftab. Um, two things I wanted to say. Uh, the first is that you know uh, I remember that when anti CA protests started, uh, there were a lot of young young people in the Jamia and there were a lot of young people the night before the police had had gone into the library and beaten students and the students were very anguished and many people called me and said you must come and speak uh, to the students and i recall uh, I, i went up uh, there were thousands of students there and and i said many things uh, the first of them was that don't let anyone ask you to prove your loyalty to this country least of all those people who have never took part in the freedom struggle how are they asking you to prove your loyalty and uh, you know my parents uh, as, as a sikh or as a hindu uh, we are indian by chance we had no other country to choose your parents grandparents had a country to choose so you are in fact indian by choice and so you know your love for this country in any case is not something that you should even uh, you know get into that's number 1 but the second thing you know i i i realize more and more uh, the anti ca protests were beautiful they were the biggest uh, uprising that we've seen in india uh, after uh, gandhi ji's uh, death and it was a time when a law which was discriminating against muslims spontaneously large numbers of hindus came out in campuses across the country uh, i was almost for those 100 days i was uh invited to, uh, you know urged to speak uh, to crowds of hundreds of thousands of people in every corner of the country and the joy of seeing hindus and muslims standing together uh, with one icon and that was uh, that was the the constitution of india with one flag which was the national flag and we stood together and i think that is uh, you know and it's not an idealistic idea because ordinary people showed us that you know given a moment we will all stand together and i still have have a lot of hope and in big things and small um to one other illustration uh, in gurgaon just gurugram just next to delhi uh, a, a strange uh, controversy was created uh, and continues uh, because a large number of migrants had come in there are only two mosques uh, a large part of the migrants were of muslim identity and they needed a place to pray so friday prayers was in more than 100 places but uh, the hindutva mobs gathered and wouldn't allow them to pray and as a response to that uh, the six said what is the problem here are gurdwaras you come and pray here many people opened up uh, you know this is our factory floor you come and pray here this is the terrace of my home you come and pray here and it is in these actions that that uh, that we this is i said also to the students that this is not a battle it's a ultimately a battle of hearts and minds have i have i allowed hatred to colonize my heart as our rulers have, are trying to make us or have i fought against this hatred and i'm determined with my 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 love and goodwill to people of every faith and identity it is in the end partitions of the heart we saw one partition on the land we are seeing millions of partitions on the heart that are being created by our leaders and it is we who will have to fight these uh, these and one last thing uh, for uh, uh, sufyan uh, afta to uh, remember is 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 we will fight this if we stand together with all oppressed people and i said this often in my uh, in my talks during the anti ca protests i i asked the the muslim uh, so had gathered in such large numbers to protest i said just let me ask you suppose suppose this was a law that didn't discriminate against muslims in india it had discriminated say against dalits would you have been here would you have come here would you have felt the same anger and pain in your heart and the answer most probably is that you would not so can we learn that the only way we can fight uh, you know the divisions that our leaders are trying to create among us is to feel the same pain and outrage if any of my brothers and sisters 
uh, are, are oppressed. She might be a Christian uh, Dalit untouchable woman in Pakistan. She might be an Adivasi in a remote forest in, in, in India. She may be Hindu, she may be Muslim, she may be Christian. She is my sister, she is my brother. I will not tolerate injustice to her. That is, I mean, many friends, you know, in, in, in India, we more and more people are losing hope. Where is the future? And I tell them there is no simple answer. It's not some electoral, you know, some jogar that we'll do and somebody will stand with the Congress, somebody will stand against it, something will happen. That's not where this battle is going to be. This is a battle of hearts and minds. It's a civilizational battle. And we must, none of us are exempt uh, from the role that we have to play in this. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, can I take uh, more questions? Because a lot of uh, raised uh, hands, uh, I, I can see. Uh, Mahesh, Sony, and then uh, Raish Saram and Sabda Zadi, please. Um, Mahesh ji. Uh, sir, uh, sir, very good uh, very good evening, sir. I'm from India, Mumbai, India. And uh, my question is, uh, in the recent times, uh, I have seen that uh, India, Pakistan, and China have together voted in the United Nations Assembly uh, against Russia, US, Russia versus Ukraine war. So, is it is it a, a semblance I can see in the in the going forward that India, Pakistan, and China must come together to represent South Asia on the international strategic perspective? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mahesh uh, Ji. Ji from Germany, please unmute can yourself. You, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> That's a wonderful event. Uh, I think everybody uh, who is participating, especially those from Pakistan and India directly. What I want to say, thanks to uh, Bhai. I have learned uh, thoroughly how and why Pakistan came to being. Now, even after a lapse of 75 years, the peoples of pa India and Pakistan are still suffering from poverty and destitute. My question is, why these uh, inhuman and sub uh, subversive socio-economic miseries had not been challenged by the governments in, in India or Pakistan seriously? Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Rezvai. Uh, uh, I take another question and then I will come to the speakers. Sabdar Zaidi, please. Sabdar, from Netherlands. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my question is actually, uh, our all speaker, uh, they were missing uh, core uh, characteristic of media from both sides. Jab tak ye hate spreading media uh, monster banate rahega ek side pe musalmano ko monster banaya ja raha hai dusri side ka media hindu ko monster banaya ja raha hai aur the media is so powerful we people we can't do anything against this media but there is there is some hope we can do because parallel media is also growing but we need to establish more groups on like youtube who can show the pakistan's common side, common people of common side and the uh, same other side. So I think we must not ignore the uh, role of media. This, this was my question and suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so please, uh, sp uh, speakers, uh, can you please respond to these three questions? I would give chance to my other three brothers. I think I Raj Mohanji, uh, I think let Raj Mohanji should say something. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> let me address the question about India, Pakistan, China coming together. It was asked. Well, that is a, it is a nice dream. It's not a realistic thing for the immediate future in terms of leaders of these countries coming together. But especially in some countries, say in Europe or Australia or America, elsewhere, people of Indian, Pakistani, Chinese origin can meet and create some bonds. So that is one possibility. Let's be realistic. 
But there are opportunities in the rest of the world which we do not take at the moment, which can be taken. I will also touch on, uh, I will reinforce what uh, Harsh uh, Bhai said about when he was speaking to the young man from Aligarh, Unka Jo Sawal Tha, Jo Harshi Bata Rahe Thay Ki Hum Kuch Chote Circle Bhi Jahan Hum Hain Ho Bana Sakte Hain. Hum Foreign Bade Masle Shayad Solve Ya Hal Nahi Kar Paayin. Lekin Agar Hum, Agar Hum Hindu Hain, To Kisi Musulman Ya Sikh Bhai Se Dosti Karein. Hum Muslim Hain, To Kisi Dalit Bhai Se Dosti Karein. To Yeh फौरन इससे कोई हमारा एक रेवोल्यूशन तो नहीं आएगा लेकिन ये छोटे कदम बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट हैं तो वो भी हम ले सकते अदर क्वेश्चंस डॉक्टर हुद भाई कैन यू प्लीज अनम्यूट योरसेल्फ एंड देन टॉक या आई कैन एक छोटी सी बात मैं कहूंगा कि अगर हुकूमतें दोनों हुकूमतें इंडिया और पाकिस्तान की ये वीजा देना शुरू करें ना तो हमारे बीच में जो तनाव है जो वक्त के साथ बढ़ा है इसमें बहुत तेजी से कमी आ सकती है तो जैसा कि हमने अभी सुना है जब लोग इधर से उधर या उधर से इधर आते हैं तो उनकी सोच एकदम बदल जाती वो वो फिर जान लेते हैं कि दरअसल हम एक ही लोग हैं शक्ल सूरत से भी और आदतों के लिहाज से भी बहुत मुमासलत है इसी वजह से तो इंडिया ने पाकिस्तान को वीज़ा नहीं दिया और पाकिस्तान ने इंडिया को इंडिया वालों को वीज़ा नहीं दिया ये मेरा ख्याल है वो चीज़ है जिससे सबसे ज़्यादा असर हो सकता है कल्चरल लेवल पर एक अगर आप इजाजत दें तो क्लैरिफिकेशन क्योंकि उसके बगैर वो ये है कि जो मुसलमान वहां रह गए वो अपनी मर्जी से रहे ये बात दुरुस्त है लेकिन ये भी ऑन रिकॉर्ड आना चाहिए कि जब वोटिंग हुई थी पाकिस्तान की और इसके ऊपर तो मुस्लिम लीग को वोट ना सिर्फ मुस्लिम मेजोरिटी प्रोविंस से मिले बल्कि मुस्लिम मनोरिटी या हिंदू मेजोरिटी प्रोविंस से भी मिले तो उसकी एक्सप्लेनेशन ये है कि अंग्रेजों ने राइट टू वोट सिर्फ प्रॉपर्टी क्लासेस को और जो एजुकेटेड थे उनको दिया हुआ था और ये वो ही लोग थे जिनका ख्याल था पाकिस्तान बनेगा तो यहाँ पे हम जाके नौकरियां करेंगे हमें हुकूमत हम मुगलों की चलाते रहे हैं अब हम यहाँ जाके चलाएंगे तो अलबत् आम मुसलमान जो कारीगर है दुकानदार है और बेतहाशा वो भी थे जो नेशनलिस मुस्लिम थे जो कभी इस पार्टीशन के हक में नहीं थे पंजाब के अंदर भी नेशनलिस्ट मुस्लिम थे मैं जहां जहां गया हूं मुझे कांग्रेस पार्टी के वर्कर्स नाइन्टीज तक नजर आए हैं वेन टू थाउजेंड एंड थ्री में मैंने जब पंजाब की पार्टीशन पे की है तो गुजरात के अंदर मुल्तान के अंदर अभी तक कांग्रेस के पुराने वर्कर्स वहां पे थे तो ये सारी स्टोरी जो है ना वो बिकॉज ऑफ द पार्टीशन और फिर वन साइडेड प्रोपोगेंडा की वजह से ये दबा दी गई है लेकिन सोशल मीडिया और ये असफदर भाई का पॉइंट बहुत जबरदस्त है जो ये जो नेशनल मीडिया है वो तो कैप्चर्ड है बाय बाय द टू यू नो एस्टेब्लिशमेंट्स इससे आजादी कैसे मिले सोशल मीडिया में तो हम एग्जिस्ट करते हैं बट वी हैव टू कीप ऑन ट्राइंग और सो आई थॉट आई वुड एड दिस के मुसलमानों को ये बोर्ड दिया तो ना मुस्लिम मनोरिटी प्रोविंस वालों ने भी उन्हें देने की क्या जरूरत थी देवर शूटिंग देम सेल्फ इन देयर ओन फुट सारे तो कुछ लोग आ गए कुछ बेचारे जो गरीब थे वो वहीं रहे हैं या लैंडलॉर्ड थे जिन्होंने बाद में अपनी जमीनें बेची और वो भी आ गए दो किस्म के लोग थे ये पार्टीशन ने पाकिस्तान के अंदर लैंडलॉर्ड क्लास को भी बचा लिया हिंदुस्तान के अंदर जिम्मेदारी खत्म हो गई तो क्लास क्वेश्चन को भी जरा नजर में रखे ना कि किसी ने क्यों कैसे वोट दिया है बट ट्रेजिडी अब ये है कि जो मुसलमान इंडिया में रह गए हैं उनका बुरा हाल है और हमने अपनी माइनॉरिटीज के साथ जो ट्रीटमेंट की हुई है वो बिल्कुल गैर इंसानी है 
वहां पे बीजेपी और ये सारी गुंडागर्दी होती है लेकिन हम तो अपनी कौन अपनी लीगल सिस्टम के जरिए अपने लोगों को ओप्रेस करते हैं तो इसके खिलाफ हमें भी बोलना चाहिए और हम बोलते रहते हैं हर वक्त थैंक यू जी यस हर्ष जी कैन आई रिपीट द क्वेश्चन ऑफ रईस भाई ही वाज आस्किंग अबाउट द यू नो प्लाइट ऑफ पुअर पीपल ऑन बोथ साइड सो कैन यू प्लीज लाइक टू कमेंट ऑन इट no i think the tragedy uh, i mean there are many tragedies of our country but uh, the the tragedy is that <clears throat> uh, the governments we, we both in both sides uh, of the border we should be holding our governments accountable for what they are doing for india's and pakistan's working poor people what they should be doing for uh, the farming community what they should be doing in terms of ensuring health care and education we saw what happened for instance during the partition uh, during the pandemic um the consequences of 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 the state's failure to build any kind of welfare system but instead of asking these questions we are being diverted uh, by our leaders and they're succeeding in diverting us uh, to questions of of uh, hatred against uh, you know finding a scapegoat and then uh, building hatred against them and until we uh, you know we we protect ourselves from that's what i i, I said if we, we we have to fight to not allow hatred to colonize our hearts uh, and only then can we ask the right questions from those who rule us may if, if, yeah. if you allow me to answer allow me to add just just very quickly uh, i think what is coming becoming clear from the questions and the comments that there is a there is a huge gap between the behavior of the governments their policies and the desires of the people on both sides yeah. and 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 the government has all the instruments and the tool to manipulate the situation and and create new conflicts and right. open new fronts i mean for example if we see that on one side there are groups who talk about akhand bharat and on the other side there are groups who talk about ghuzwai hind and they both radicalize people and also in both countries if you see that rss running uh, thousands and thousands of schools and on on pakistani side also large religious groups running thousands and thousands of schools so they have now the question here is this this gap between the governmental attitude and people's desires how can we bridge this gap so they will never become one because government is basically an instrument of oppression they will continue that but how can we minimize this gap uh, between the governments and the desires of the people yeah thank you so i take uh, more questions uh, uh, rashna naik and uh, uh, iram uh, please rashna ji please unmute yourself and then ask question hello can you hear me yes uh, good evening everyone uh, my question is like uh, this partition happened because of politics that time and till date uh, whatever rivalry is seen between india and pakistan is also because of politics at some higher levels but is it true that now when western world is seeing india as a market and pakistan as a weapon for india in form of terrorism i think it is not in much uh, it has not in common man's hand to see the dream of peace between these countries yeah thank you rajna ji uh, iram ji you. iram please unmute yourself iram gol okay Uh, so i take another question usman khan usman unmute yourself usama and ask khan. usama khan usama. sorry us- usama yeah, yeah please ho oh, yeah. gaya awaaz nahi aa rahi wo pass kar gaya baith gaya idhar okay usama to the next one go to the next question then okay uh, we ca- uh, come to you later uh, masood mirza ji unmute kijiyega please apne aap um, thank you very much aram gul karna chahti hai aad aram gul ha aram gul she is trying last time bhi usko chance nahi tha mila pata nahi 
वाई शी डजेंट गेट कनेक्टेड एरम गुल साजिद जी जी मसूद जी थैंक यू Uh, as we see that uh, populist ideologies based on the slogans of religion and uh, race are very dangerous because they betray the people from their basic problem in case of pakistan we have already seen it disintegrated and still it is uh, bogged up in many problems but as many uh, as some of the enlightened speakers have pointed out that in the beginning few decades the secular based democratic system in india it was a ray of hope for the people also progressive people in pakistan now for the last 8 years we see that in india india is also drifting in the same policies like in pakistan and there there are slogans of hindutva and uh, akhand bharat and in pakistan people talk imran khan like people like imran khan about madina state and thing ghazwa e hind uh, do you see any ray of hope because uh, in india in pakistan it is very very difficult because one point which was perhaps not discussed uh, is that in pakistan is the situation is more complicated because because of this religious uh, movements on the other hand on the other hand uh, pakistani politics is in the hands of civil and military oligarchy and whether nawaz sharif comes into power or imran khan they would not leave security policy and foreign policy to be decided by the politicians so it is a very difficult situation but in case of india i don't know military whether military speaks so much important role or not so i hope there are some there some movement uh, raises also from in india which is progressive and give us again hope in pakistan also because basic of uh, the of the constitutional basis of india was secular and social democratic in the beginning do you see possibilities because pakistan is very very difficult situation i understand uh, sorry <laughs> thank you thank you thank you rajmohan ji yeah i will try to respond to this yeah please i, I want uh, is it masood mirza sahab is that his name Yeah. Yes. Uh, I want him to be disillusioned about India. Let him not imagine that things in India are particularly promising. They are really very depressing. They are very disturbing. Uh, the Indian state uh, is very much now in the hands of people who believe in divisive ideas, who believe in. Uh, intimidation who believe in second class status for india's muslims and the media is also like that much of it uh, so uh, let's be realistic that both in pakistan and in india this is a very 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 tough battle a long term battle in the meantime in small groups in india and pakistan and in the rest of the world we can fight to to change the situation i'm sure in the, and i know that in the long run justice and truth and compassion will triumph and hatred and and and, and fear and will be defeated but let us be realistic the situation is extremely serious both in pakistan and in india and in some other parts of the world too so uh, when the change will come how the change will come only the almighty knows this we can play our small part let us not dismiss very small modest efforts in small circles wherever we are thank you sir thank you sir yeah ishtiaq bhai iram sajid please iram sir people i think people can ask questions we are okay. always there to respond yeah. and i would rather yeah. my other colleagues got more chance yeah. to do it i'll step in only when i think something about the politics of it has to be brought forth ha ji okay iram aap sawal kar lijiye please iram to nahi ji main unka miyan baat kar raha hu sajid gauri ji sajid aap baat kijiye aap kar le 
मेरा सवाल ये है कि पचहत्तर साल हो गए हैं इंडिया पाकिस्तान के लोग अभी तक नॉर्मल नहीं हुए नॉर्मल की बात ना होने की वजह ये है कि हमारे जो कॉलोनियल रूलर की लेगेसी थी रिलीजियस एक्सट्रीमिज्म वो अभी तक काम नहीं हो सका तो उसको काम करने की कोई हमें रेमेडीज बताएं कि किस तरह हम ये जो सबसे वर्स्ट ऑफ द वर्स्ट कॉलोनियल लेगेसी थी रिलीजियस एक्सट्रीमिज्म जो प्लांटेड लीडरशिप हमारे ऊपर इम्पोज की गई इसने हम दोनों कौमों को लड़ाया और अभी तक वैसे ही सिलसिला है क्योंकि रेमेडीज इसकी क्या है कि किस तरह हम नॉर्मल बन सकते हैं और इन लोगों से निजात हासिल कर सकें या थैंक यू डॉक्टर साहब लेट मी टेक अनदर क्वेश्चन नवनीत रंजन साहब यस प्लीज आई कैन आई कैन आस माय क्वेश्चन इफ यू अलाउ या प्लीज ओके दिस क्वेश्चन इज प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर प्रवेश हुड बॉय प्रोफेसर साहब यू से दैट इफ देयर इज अ फ्री वीजा रेजीम the relation between india and pakistan will improve there was virtually free visa regime before 1965 war yet i doubt if the india pakistan relation was good what was the reason if india pakistan re relation was not good even in the pre 65 time when the visa regime was open thank you yeah thank you can i Professor, uh, respond professor istiaq saab can also respond both of both of the, them are my heroes and uh, uh, i look upon this as my achievement to talk to you thank you uh, okay now uh, relations were yeah, never good pervez pervez you let him speak first i i will then okay add. okay thanks relations were never good after all we had a war in 1947 the first kashmir war was then but uh, when people used to go across the border both ways there was an understanding between the peoples and of course the governments and in of course particularly pakistan which wanted to capture kashmir and which then uh, did operation gibraltar in 1965 was uh, was out and out to capture territory in from india and that then uh, lead, led to further bad blood and then we saw kargil happen later and so forth however the relations between the people were much better then than they are now so i am not proposing i am not suggesting that uh, opening the borders will be a panacea which will solve all problems that is not the case but it will go some way towards calming down the two peoples if we have trade if we have some degree of interdependence that will be still better and we can have trade after all you see that china and india have something like 80 billion dollars of trade every year in spite of the fact that they are not on good terms with each other so um as a way towards normalization i propose this nothing more at the political level we have to move and i gave uh, my point of view on this that uh, calm down kashmir accept it as uh, the status quo uh, ishtiaq went one step further he said accept it as the line, as the international border which is also okay but it would be acceptable now on either side not india not pakistan but yeah eventually that sort of thing will need to be worked out uh, dr krishna if i if, if i could respond uh first of all it wasn't all that bad after the partition yes immediately after the partition the horrific killings they are the trauma which for generations has uh, affected people but still on both sides people knew each other let me first of all to uh, mr ghori i would like to say this way of equating that on both sides there were religious fanatics is a wrong proposition the congress party was never a religious party at all it was a secular open inclusive party and you had some of the leading muslim scholars of the time supporting it not only 
ابول کلام آزاد بٹ دا ہیڈ آف دا دیوبند سیمینری مولانا حسین احمد مدنی سو آئی ڈونٹ تھنک یو کین سی دیٹ دا کانگریس اینڈ دا مسلم لیگ ور پارٹیز آف ٹو فنیٹیکل ایکسٹریمسٹ گروپس ان پاکستان ان دا سب کانٹیننٹ دیٹ از ان کوریکٹ دا سیکنڈ از دا مسلم لیگ ڈیفینیٹلی واز اٹ واز اینٹ ایکسٹریمسٹ in terms of the pe- the way people dressed and all but the ideas that hindus and muslims cannot live together <coughs> is a very extremist idea which requires ultimately 1 million people killed 15 million people you know forced out of their homes and yet it's the muslims who needed protection of the indian state to stay on in india so the record of india in relation to pakistan is infinitely better what is happening now is most regret- regrettable. Raj Mohan Ji and Harsh Bhai all are aware of the new India which is emerging, which is Hindu Rashtra. But that was not the idea of India, not at all. What about relations? In 1950, uh, the Commonwealth cricket team arrived in the subcontinent and Prime Minister's team from India played against it. Do you know Jawaharlal Nehru called up the Pakistani government and said, I need three of your cricketers to take part in it. Fazil Mahmood, Khan Muhammad, the fast bowlers, and Imtiaz Ahmed, the wicket keeper. They, fought, they went there and Imtiaz scored 300 runs not out. This is in 1950. 1955, I was an eight-year-old. sitting in Lahore when the India-Pakistan test match took place and Pakistan's High Commissioner to India, Raja Ghazanfar Ali Khan, said anybody from India, especially Amritsar and all, who wanted to come to Pakistan to watch the match can do it. And thousands of people came. How many attended the cricket match, I don't know. But they went to all the streets and the mohallas and the local people, Shah Ji and Chaudhary Saab and Mia Saab and Pandit Ji and, you know, Rai Saab, they were all crying and, and embracing one another. I've seen that with my own eyes. I'm witness to it. It is after the 65 war that a systematic curtain was brought down. And that has been made worse after the 71 war and Kargil especially, I think, If somebody asks me which is the greatest blunder Pakistan made, I think it is Kargil when two governments had agreed on peace and even the Kashmir issue could have been dealt, up, dealt with in a far better manner. Uh, this Kargil thing sabotaged it. So I think this has to be put on record. Who did what? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the two brilliant people responding to my questions. Thanks. Yeah, please, uh, Farhad, uh, can you please ask your question? And yes. then, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, I am asking my question from Parvez Gudbai. And since many years, Parvez Gudbai has uh, proclaimed or uh, put that stance that uh, let's put the tunation theory into the Bay of Bengal. And back in 2019, he also put that stance in Karachi Literary Festival. So I want to ask from Parvez Gudbai that uh, what are your recommendations in this regard? Means how we can inculcate in the minds of people that there is no need of any ideology where our own politician means still in Pakistan, the major politician like Imran Khan and many other religious politicians are saying that Pakistan ka matlab kya la ila illa la. They are still think that the two nation theory is relevant by mentioning uh, the uh, issues with the Muslims in India. So how can we inculcate in the minds of people that there is no need of any ideology? Okay. <laughs> well, if the slogan for Pakistan is Pakistan ka matlab kya la 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 la, then surely the, the uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa must uh, take over Afghanistan, because after all, in Afghanistan, there are the same people who live over there as who live on this side of the Durand line. So then 
uh, we must extend our border all the way over there. And then, of course, Iran also becomes a part of Pakistan because uh, Islam does not recognize any geographical borders and the whole thing becomes completely ridiculous. Now, how is the two nation theory harmful for Pakistan at this point in history? We all know that the two nation theory is what led to Pakistan. But why is it harmful now? Because it ignores the legitimate cultural diversity which exists in Pakistan. And instead, there is rule by Punjab over Balochistan, over Sindh, and in fact, I would say even, well, and certainly over Gilgit Baltistan, but also much of KPK, uh, NWFP, whatever. The fact that when you say that religion alone makes a nation, then creates such enormous aberrations that people simply cannot live together in peace. I'm not even talking about minorities. The Hindus mostly have fled Pakistan. The Christians are hiding. I'm talking about the Muslims of Pakistan. Even they cannot live under this two nation theory, which says that everybody is the same. Because then it is only Punjab, which is Pakistan. Every other nationality has to be crushed. You do not mention it in your textbooks. You send in your army to crush the Baloch. And that is the consequence of the two nation theory. This is why we must get rid of it. I very strongly endorse that. There is no basis. Once you have the state, and it is a Muslim majority state, what's the issue, bhai? You wanted Pakistan, you got it. Now move forward, be part of the world, give equal rights, and be a normal state. What we are saying is doable tomorrow. Thank you so much, Yeah, I take in other questions as well. Uh, Tayyib uh, or Rushdia, uh, Ashif Akil Saab, and uh, Vinod Ji. Um, Tayyib, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all the doctors. <laughs> um, first thing, uh, my question is, the, the two-nation theory was collapsed already when, when, the, when Pakistan was made, because leaving 35 billion million Muslim in India was, you know, it was, it was, in my opinion, it was already, it didn't make any sense. Now, the other question, my other question is, the map of India, how to divide the map of India was already there, as I, as I read and I've, I've seen a couple of documentaries uh, that uh, before, b before appointing the uh, the last vice viceroy of uh, of India, there was already a map there. So the imperialist, whether it was America or Britain, they wanted actually to divide India, and because because they didn't want to uh, flourish the uh, socialism or communism in India, which was already establishing. So that was uh, in my opinion, opinion or the opinions of yours as well that it it, it was actually it, it was it, it was made to divide now my question is that now will these powers whether america or britain or all these imperialists would they allow us to 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 get together and live live together yeah, thank you, Tayyip. Uh, 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 let me, uh, Ishaji, uh, let me take uh, another question from uh, Rushdia and Asif Akil. Uh, yeah, so I oh, guess it's me, Rushdia. Yeah, yeah, Rushdia, yeah. please. Yeah, thank you so much for giving me a chance. Uh, I'm calling from Montreal. Um, my question is similar to what uh, Tayyip Bhai just mentioned. Uh, about uh, about like this whole uh, uh, idea of partition and all. Um, oftentimes we start the idea with uh, you know 
like Gina or, uh, you know, like Gina wanted, or there was this thing of like, we wanted uh, a Muslim nation and all. Um, we, we, I, I guess we don't have time, but we don't go back to like, why? Like, why, why did you not want, you know, like it was not simply the idea that we want Muslims, right? There was, there was some things happening on the ground. I said it in the chat earlier about, uh, you know, like what was happening in 1920s, you know, like what was, uh, you know, uh, there was, there was RSS uh, being formed, uh, you know, the, and it was formed clearly on the lines of, uh, of Mussolini and, and, and Hitler. So there was all of this happening, right? And we are not talking about it. So I'm just wondering if we could maybe like speak to that as to like why minority Muslims in majority Hindu states had voted for Pakistan. There must be a reason for that, right? It's not just for the sake of, you know, like wanting to have a Pakistan a like Muslim state or something like that. And in fact, you know, like, uh, Perry Anderson in his Indian ideology goes back and he looks at, at all the documents and all the what what the Yabhai just was mentioning also like British like how they played a role in this you know, so he goes back into the into British, British archives and, and, and looks at like where this idea was born and who was pushing whom and what was happening I mean I'm saying this also because even around like CA and RC people said oh this is Pakistanization of India I mean, Pakistan existed for a reason. Yes, maybe some people had like a romantic idea of the of, of Pakistan of Muslim state, but what was the reason? I think we, we need to talk about that. And I, I wonder if uh, if uh, Rajmohan Gopal uh, Gandhi ji, if you want to talk about it, and also Harshmandar ji, if you want to like mention about that, because we often talk about this, you know, uh, like you know, like what they wanted, like a Mughal thing or. Um, yeah, thank you, Rishita ji. Thank you. Uh, let me let thank me you. ask uh, first from uh, uh, to respond. Uh, this this uh, both are good questions, and uh, I want uh, all of our speakers to respond on it. Uh, uh, please, Ishak ji, start. Uh, I want to start with you, and then uh, other speakers. I didn't really understand Rushdia ji's question really, because it seemed that. She th thought that there was a justification and Jinnah was demanding something legitimate. But in the end, she brought in the role of the British and imperialism. And I think that part is correct. Because if you read my book on Jinnah, I show over almost 50 words, 50 pages, the British documents step by step by step saying that and India under Jawaharlal Nehru with his secularism and anti-imperialism and socialism would be sympathetic to the Soviet Union. Therefore, if India is to remain united and they had this cabinet mission plan, it should be a loose India with a weak center with all the rights vested in the provinces and such an India should be under defense treaty tied to the British. Secondly, when they realized that that was not going to be possible because the Cong Congress did not want an India without an effective center, they then went for the partition. The partition idea in the pipeline was, existed always as the B option. In 1943, when uh, Lord Wavell came as the second last Viceroy, the outgoing Viceroy Lord Linlithgow told him that we are here for another 30 years. They had no plans of leaving India, not an India to secular, socialist, anti-imperialist people in any case. But the Second World War broke their back and ultimately they had to leave. That's the background of it. Ji, Raj Mohan Ji. Yeah. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I thank uh, Tayyab Ji and uh, Rushdi Aji for their important questions, but I will. I want us now to um, to be really frank and uh, uh, look at ourselves also. Today, India has 1.4 billion people. Pakistan has nearly 300 million people. Uh, Indians and Pakistanis are influential in many parts of the world. How long will we continue to blame 
the Europeans, the British, the Americans. What Ishtiaq Pai has said is absolutely correct. This was the, the plan, but we can't just continue blaming the, now Britain. How many people does Britain have? I mean, look at, look at what the capacity million. today of India and Pakistan and Bangladesh in the world. How long will you continue blaming these people? Now, you know, one of my biggest quarrels when it comes to the history of partition, everybody speaks of the Radcliffe line. Ki Radcliffe aya, pehle kabhi Hindustan gaya nahi, usne line bana di. Again, we forget that along with Rad, Radcliffe, there were four Indian judges in Punjab, two Muslim, two non-Muslim, four Indian judges in Bengal, two Muslim, two non-Muslim. They could not agree. If they had agreed, Radcliffe would have had no chance. How long will we act like children and continue to blame other people for our problems? Yes, they all played a wicked part, sure. But we must now get our act together. It's very tough. Today's Pakistan, today's India are in a terrible situation, and it's a great competition between the two as to which is worse. Uh, but and if a few of us, whether inside India, inside Pakistan, or in the rest of the world, that if some of us get together and with the absolute determination that we will find a way to live together, work together, we will find an answer. May I say something? Yes, I think it is absolutely spot on what Raj Mohanji said right now. How long are we going to continue to blame the British? Of course, they had bad intent over there. Of course, they were the imperialists. Of course, they wanted to continue, continue their influence. But let us recognize that the tension between Hindus and Muslims were older than, than those created by the British. The British accept, exacerbated them, made them worse, but those tensions were there. And the difference between Hindus and Muslims in terms of achievement became bigger and bigger as time went on. Muslims did not agree to modern education, to science, to admitting new ways of thinking, and so they were left further and further behind. And so when partition came, it was not a British conspiracy that Muslims were less educated, were less capable, had fewer positions in the bureaucracy and in the military as compared to Hindus. It was internal reasons. It was the belief that Muslims are the most superior people on earth. And now after partition, for heaven's sakes, it's not the British, it's not the Americans who have conspired to keep Pakistan backwards and promote India. Anyone who believes this is, uh, I think, fooling himself. It is because we Pakistanis have a particular way of thinking and we have ruined our education system. Today, there is hardly any university in Pakistan which is worth being called a university. And so don't blame the British for that. Don't blame the Americans for that. Blame us. Blame Pakistanis and our warped view of, the, of religion in public affairs, in affairs of the state. That's where the problem is. And, and, and may I just add uh, literally a couple of lines of endorsement to everything that um, all, all three speakers said before me uh, in response. Uh, I just wanted to say to uh, 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 Rushtiaji that yes, there was a problem that, uh, uh, that uh, the Muslim League uh, tried to provide a, a, a solution to. Uh, but the solution was not two nations. That is the point. The point was that yes, they may, they were, uh, you know, there was in uh, Muslims were a minority in in many respects they faced oppression. So did other groups like the Dalits, for instance. So did uh, Adivasis. Uh, so did many groups. The solution was not that we then divide up the country into these, you know, homogeneous 
geographical entities uh, containing each of these oppressed groups as separate nations. The idea, the, the, the solution was, was the problem. And I said it earlier as well, the, the idea that we are, we are going to be safe and we're going to progress uh, only in our samenesses. And sameness is only uh, identified uh, on the one axis of religion. That was the problem. So, uh, so we're not denying that, uh, that there was a problem that Mus uh, Indian Muslims faced uh, prior to partition. All that uh, we are saying is that partition and the two-nation theory was not an answer to that problem. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me take other questions. Vinod Mumbai uh, ji, or then Muhammad Abdullah ji, Vinod ji. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I thank Parvez, my oldest, one of my oldest friends, for mentioning my name. Uh, I was uh, <clears throat> a child of six in Pali Jamaat in Lahore when partition took place and we had to uh, flee across what became a line that we never thought before would be a border. Anyway, that's long ago, but I saw this senseless violence that was displayed in the pictures that you started with on both sides as we went to Amritsar and Firozpur, et cetera, et cetera, finally winding up in Delhi about four or five months later. So <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, second uh, Parvez's notion that whenever how to move forward, uh, that is the key right now. We have gone through all and we all have our opinions. And I've read Istiag Bhai's books. Uh, I think I have met Harsh uh, Mandarji several times in, in various places, etc. And we share pretty much the same ideas. We may have slightly different reasons for causes and effects and so on. Uh, there is uh, the British role and, and all that, and it's too late. It's, there's not enough time to enter into all that uh, discussion right now. But all I'd like to say is that in overseas environments and wherever we meet, and we have a history of almost 50 years when Parvez and I both lived in Cambridge, Mass., we started group of concerned South Asians. And there are many such groups. In, in fact, the largest group, hundreds of people are South Asia Peace Action Network, of which I'm also a small part. And that is a internet group and spans and does a lot of things together and so forth. So I think uh, the idea of visa abolition to me for many years has made a lot of sense. Uh, for me, of course, uh, Lahore is, uh, is my vatan, it's my homeland. I've been back there, but recently, a few years ago, I was denied a visa, although I'm a US citizen now, uh, to go and visit Lahore. And the reasons cited are just as absurd as anything else, that you once held an Indian passport on the same basis, people are denied visas who once held a Pakistani passport to come to India, et cetera. So this is one concrete step that we can bring to bear upon our respective governments in the two countries. And I think it will have a very positive effect. It will not solve all the problems, of course, which are manifold, but it will, I think, have uh, ha have an effect. Thank you. Um, can uh, I just uh, add something? Uh, just, just, uh, just to just uh, 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 hold on. Uh, I have uh, other people. Uh, I'm sorry, me, I'm sorry, give them chance. Then you can come. I just wanted to add later. Muhammad Abdullah. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for giving me the chance. Uh, I am Abdullah from uh, Kasur, Pakistan. 
Uh, my question is actually there are three stakeholders at the time of partition um, it's Muslim League, uh, Congress and Britishers. The Britishers took the most advantage of the uh, partition and after separation when they wanted they use both India and Pakistan of their use. But now they have gone and uh, it's uh, upon India and Pakistan to normalize their relations. But instead of doing it, we have a lot of opportunities like India's uh, space program and India is very good in IT and sciences and uh, his space program is very good. Uh, so instead of collaborating in uh, those uh, sciences and uh, space programs and uh, on the other side, uh, uh, Pakistan has a huge opportunity with China like CPAC and India can participate if they both countries can normalize their relationships and uh, China has uh, uh, um, surrounded both India and Pakistan and they have uh, trade with Pakistan and India. So why can't we uh, see this perspective and take things and our government take things on that level? Thanks, Abdullah, for your suggestions. Usama, if your speaker is, uh, your mic is good, uh, can you can you please ask your question? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, my name is Usama. I'm from Faisalabad, Pakistan, Punjab. Uh, my question is about two nation theory. Now, uh, the two nation theory, I am going to connect it with two things, two events in history. The first is the Taif Agreement in that resolved Lebanon civil conflict. In the Taif Agreement, the Taif Agreement in the, for the Lebanon. Uh, so basically it was used to remove all the uh, religious divisions and the problems of political parity. So if you look at the parliament of the Lebanon, Christians, even though their population is lower than the Muslims, they have equal seats as compared as uh, uh, Muslims. There are also Catholic Muslims. There are also Protestant Muslims. There are also Maronite Muslims. So basically they have recognized the differences among the nations, but they have, uh, you can say, activated the coexistence policy. Like American motto, e pluribus unum, out of many one because America is a nation of nations, okay? So the Taif Agreement did recognize that there are differences among the re uh, religions and did recognize that there are different nations because there was a Lebanon conflict that was going on and the Taif Agreement provided a coexistence solution so that it provided a parity in the uh, parliament representation, equal seats, uh, about, according to the religion. If you can see the Lebanon, you can see Maronite Christians, Catholic Christians, Protestant Christian, Muslims. Yeah, so Osama, I, what, what is your question, nations, please? What is the question? My question is that two, uh, what I, I'm, uh, my question is to Hudboy and Ishmistra Rishtia, the two nation theory is a fact, but you, you are basically attacking two nation theory because it has been utilized for partition. Okay, that's okay. But two nation theory, differences in nation, it's a fact. There are uh, multiple nations in India. But uh, I don't think that it can be utilized for the partition. It can be utilized for the coexistence like in Taif Agreement. Or America has utilized its in E Pluribus Uno, out of many man. It's a nation of nations. Yeah, thank you. So it's, in, actually, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Well, but we can always yeah. ask why just two yeah, why, nations. Yani, I mean, we have to give is... us a chance to speak. I mean, this what this gentleman is saying is highly questionable, and I want to get a chance to respond to it. I'm a political scientist, and yeah, I know please. what he's talking about, uh, and why it was adopted in the Lebanon, and it has been disastrous for Lebanon. Look at 70, 75 onwards, the civil war and so much killing. The French wanted the Christian minority to get more seats and they made the president the strongest in the constitution. Uh, the prime minister had to be a Sunni and the uh, Shia had to be uh, head of the assembly. And later on, it was found out that there were more Sunnis and even more Shias in Lebanon who have been underrepresented. So it's been a total failure. 
it was a project to hand over power to their favorites before they left. There is nothing charming about that model at all, and it's not workable. Second, okay, if you say Muslims are a nation, Hindus are a nation, so what? They can be nations and still live together. Don't we all live yes. abroad? I mean, ask anyone here. We live with Danes, with Swedes, with they don't think we are Swedes in the Swedish sense, but nobody gives a damn. We are saying the basis of religion should not be in the division of country and the subsequent bloodshed which followed. One thing more before I because uh, Yani referring to Perry Anderson is such bad scholarship. That man has never set his foot on India, on Indian soil or Pakistani soil. He just borrowed some material from a person I don't want to answer. It's a bad book. It's unbelievable these people think that they can parachute into the subcontinent and tell us what is right and what is wrong. He's never been an Indian scholar, a scholar of the subcontinent, and he ends up writing a book. He's done these nasty things to many other scholars. And, and so I don't think Perry Anderson is any person to talk, tell us about what happened and why it happened. Yeah, Dr. Hudbal. Yes, Lebanon was a disaster. Ishtiaq has very correctly said that. But my question is, why talk about two nations? In Pakistan today, there are 30 nations, people who are historically separate groups of people and they think of themselves as having a different history they have different languages and they can relate with each other they intermarry with each other within that group so we can easily identify 30 nations within today's pakistan does that mean that they are entitled to statehood no i don't think so Baluchistan, yes, I have a great deal of sympathy for those who are struggling against the Punjab-dominated state. But can Baluchistan by, its, by itself survive economically? Would it have the capacity to run itself to, to uh, given its Sardari structure? Would it be possible for it to move ahead fast? No, I don't think so. Would I be in favor of a Gilgit Baltistani state? No, I think that Again, they are under domination from Punjab, but it is much better that we work out our problems. We have representation depending upon the amount of population, perhaps, or some other criteria. And maybe, as in Lebanon, maybe we can, uh, we can get to some kind of a formula for power sharing, but that formula has to be publicly debated. And its pros and cons have to be put before an electorate and then it can derive its legitimacy from there. Yeah, this consociation, it's called consociational democracy. It freezes a group on the basis of any particularity. It could be religion, it could be sect as for example, Shia and Sunni in Lebanon. It has many dangerous uh, characteristics to it. I'm not in favor of it. But power sharing, definitely, if you have a true federation, that's the best way to share power. Let the Baloch have all the right over the resources they have, which they then share with the rest of the Pakistanis and Punjab and all. Within Punjab, I want the Saraiki people to have far more freedom than the way they are treating them. So all that is possible without necessarily breaking up states and creating refugee crises and mass killings and hatred and all that. That's what we are against. Not against people being represented and given their legitimate rights. Correct. I agree. Yes. Raj Mohanji, do you want to uh, comment, please? When uh, Parvez says that there are 30 nations in Pakistan, there probably are about four to 500 nations uh, in India of that kind. So I think these are, these are legitimate points, but we have to find if, if, 
some kind of settlement agreement, if possible, among people. And if not, then uh, the majority opinion prevails. But you know what? What I feel uh, about our conversation here is that it's not it's not difficult to propose some wonderful ideal solutions. Uh, who can, who can object to a visa-free situation? Who can object to more trade? But let's be realistic. Today, the climate, both in India and Pakistan, is so hostile to any step forward. Oh. It does not mean that we should not think of eventual solutions. But even more than work, figuring out eventual formula or eventual solutions, we need these circles like like the one that's been created through dialogue today of people who get to know each other uh, listen to each other and and again to repeat my my pet sentence form small circles of trust and understanding and then we will go forward ji harishi no i i um, the only thing i wanted to add was that you know we are composed of many identities uh, you know, and, and and I think it's important to remember uh, when you're talking about somebody constituting a group, constituting a, a nation, you're privileging one identity over over others, and that's very presumptuous as well. Yeah. Uh, I remember, for instance, um, Amartya Sen has written about this. Shabana Azmi once said, I forget exactly, but she said, I'm I, I, I'm a woman. I'm a, an Indian. I'm a I'm I'm a Muslim. I'm an a actor. I'm a slum activist. I'm uh, and ten other things. Now, uh, uh, so I think that that when we uh, a lot of communal thinking really starts because we are privileging one identity. And Bangladesh actually showed us if we ever needed an example that yes, we are Muslim. Uh, but we're also Bengali and we love our country, we love our language, we love our culture and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think that we need the, where I started off, I think it is, uh, you know, to believe that, that we have to seek safety in creating homogeneous units of sameness is a very dangerous uh, and, and it's futile and it's dangerous. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, because we are uh, we are, we are so we have so many identities, and I think we have to reimagine our politics and our and, and the world that we want to build and the nations that we want to build in terms of respect, and not of seeking uh, equal respect and equal rights and not samenesses. Yes, thank you. Uh, Sufyan, uh, Asif Akil, uh, Senji. Could I speak? Yeah, please. Okay, before I come to my point, just one or two lines on two nation theory. In the South Asian context, two nation theory means Hindus are a nation, Muslims are a separate nation. Now, Hindus are a nation means apart from other things, Hindus are a homogeneous body, Muslims are a homogeneous body. As Harshji has just now pointed out, that each every individual has got multiple identities. Hindus are a nation means a Hindu is always predominantly a Hindu. His Bengaliness, his Tamilness, or her Odiyaness, or whatever, that has to be subjugated to her Hinduness. That's a very dangerous thing. I'll stop at that. The second part, uh, uh, Wahidji has mentioned that there is a, a huge gap between what the governments think and what the people think. I still recall 2001 Agra conclave. At one point of time, it, it was looking that an agreement between India and Pakistan is really possible. Parvez, Parvez Musharraf, he became almost a hero here in India. But at the end of the day, because of various reasons, because of probably even tussle between Advani and Bajpi and all that, the whole thing collapsed. The moment it collapsed, Parvez Musharraf was back to being a villain. My point is that the rulers who are in power 
they have tremendous capacity to set the agenda people are an amorphous entity unless the rulers are changed just bhaya people of course we should do something we must do something we must do people to people contract contact but this people to people contact even people to people contact is also ultimately to be geared to changing the rulers uh, otherwise there is no peace no progress that's my point your comments please thank you uh, uh, abdullah farooqi can you please ask your question then I go to speakers. Uh, sir, I have a question from uh, uh, Survey Food by regarding two nature. Uh, sorry, I, uh, I've gone a little bit late with the discussion, uh, but I have uh, heard the Survey Food by regarding uh, two nation theory. That uh, uh, he said in one, uh, one speech that uh, two nation theory is completely failed, and he said that um, uh, it was uh, one of a uh, confusion uh, statement of. Uh, Ajena or other pioneer of two nation theory, and this confusion is finally finished uh, in 1971 in the Bay of Bengal. So, the question uh, which I have from uh, Dr. Bez Bhutbai is that, that uh, uh, we have like an uh, argument like that, that, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, a Muslim country, like uh, this is one of the incidents of history that. Uh, uh, Bangladesh is separated from Pakistan. It might be uh, another time uh, uh, KPK or other uh, Balochistan liberation might be. They are also separated. This is uh, one of the incidents of history. And another point is that, that uh, for example, if they, uh, uh, the argument is that if uh, Bangladesh rejoin uh, India, uh, maybe the two nation theory is failed because uh, uh, then uh, they did not remind Muslim as a, as a complete nation. So I have to clear this uh, uh, confusion and uh, question from Parvez uh, by to respond. Yeah, thank you, Abdullah. Uh, I hope uh, uh, Dr. Hudbhai and other speakers, Sorry, you sir, have... May uh, I interrupt, sir? Okay, I'll, I'll be brief because I know yeah. time is running out. Yes, I did say that the two-nation theory now is uh, no longer needed in Pakistan anymore. I did say at the literature festival that Jinnah had no plan for Pakistan. He, he did not make clear whether this would be a secular state or a Sharia state. You can look for his pronouncements in either direction. Jinnah did not write a book. Jinnah did not write a draft constitution. Jinnah did not make a plan for Pakistan. And that is why Pakistan was born in a state of confusion. I know many people are very angry with me in Pakistan. I know that is why I've been blacklisted from all literature festivals in Pakistan. That's okay. It doesn't bother me. But the truth is that Mr. Jinnah had one and only one objective in making Pakistan. And that was to be the great leader of all Muslims of the subcontinent and to never have to never yes sir, uh, abdullah please uh, can you please mute yourself uh, just listen that listen to yeah, yeah. doctor so jena had this vision that uh, vision i would not say but he had only one thing in mind which was to be qaide azam and he became qaide azam because he single-mindedly pursued the idea of Pakistan. And those who say that he did not want Pakistan, I am actually quite amazed by them because since 1937, there was never his relenting on that. And even the cabinet mission plan, okay, he saw that as a compromise. He saw that as something that um, that was unanticipated, he would have taken that. Of course, that the fact that uh, the Congress messed up, and it was something that Jinnah took advantage of. All that is history. But I come back to my central point, which is that Jinnah had no plans for Pakistan. And if that makes people 
angry letter could i have the privilege of you know yes please i think my please. my to one bits because what pervez is saying i have demonstrated in 808 pages precisely i mean it is very clear if you read what he says the positions he takes they are all about how to bring about the division of india and if you want to divide india what is it that divides hindus and muslims it is religion it's as simple as that he was a lawyer given this task and he had a vengeance that mahatma gandhi had captured the fancy of the indian masses and he thought that he was leader number 1 second to no one a personal vendetta and some opportunities like during the second world war uh, the british wanted indians to help the congress was not billing they even started the quit india movement and the congress was for 3 years in jail that was when jina made the breakthrough i i'm all this is heavily referenced with original documents so i think there is no doubt that jina really what he wanted was india partitioned and he had it that's all so uh, uh, because uh, timing uh, running out uh, uh, i want uh, every uh, speaker uh to comment uh, you know for for a last comment please uh, so we start with uh, rajmohan ji uh by keeping uh, uh the scope of this uh, uh dialogue and the questions that uh, have uh, put uh, forward from our participants rajmohan ji please i want to thank all participants i want to thank everyone for the views they've expressed we are not going to find a solution through this 3 hour session but i think we have taken at least a step forward i appreciate everybody's uh, 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 participation and look forward to their continuing initiative thank you ji har ji um just uh, let me repeat it's been a pleasure uh, to be with Uh, all of you for these few hours uh, uh uh sisters and brothers from across the border uh thinking about um and you know i don't think imagining a, a better future is is a pointless exercise i think uh you know we need to uh you know the, the building of a better world uh, starts with, with with our imagination of it and uh, i was you know the uh, courage and forthrightness with which uh, parvez bhai and uh, imtiaz bhai spoke i think uh, is is extremely uh, promising i think the defense of the idea uh, that we have to sort of form homogeneous identities to live together with peace i think we need to agree to abandon that idea uh we need uh, you know the world uh, the chances that we uh, we're living in a world where the chances that your neighbor is not going to look like you worship like you uh, eat like you dress like you uh, speak your language is greater and greater and greater so how are we going to live together with people who are who we see as different from us are we going to be uh, angry suspicious resentful or are we going to be friendly and welcoming and curious and have goodwill and faith i think that's going to decide the future of of the world that we leave to our children and i think this there's a much greater dialogue that we need to have let's leave jinha sahab behind uh, let's leave gandhi ji behind let's look to our future and say what kind of uh, country and world do we want to leave to our children do we want one which is based on friendship and and goodwill and trust and equality and justice and freedom or do we want another and let's make a clear choice and i think you know i, I think uh, let's stop debating jinna and let's start looking to the future thank you dr siak please thank you very much i mean this has been an unbel- unbelievably stimulating discussion the take away from the discussion today is that we are all very well aware that the problem lies at the level of the power elites the ruling elites 
given a chance, I think people and their shared wisdom, culture, so many things will go for friendship, cooperation, because that's how throughout history societies have progressed. So if in Pakistan we want to undo poverty and in India the same, we can't direct our scarce resources to buying more and more weapons and neglecting education and health facilities. All this is very clear. So I would say that uh, for me, this has been an important beginning because this is the first time that we have succeeded to have our colleagues from India and us discussing together. And we agree on almost everything about details and all one thing just for my I didn't want to talk about the British I did it only in response to a question I don't think we should blame the British or the Americans this is childish we have to I mean we are independent nations and now is the time to try to go forward this ideology of hatred has to be abandoned in the best interest of Pakistan. Two things before I go. I was against the partition intellectually. I've shown it why it has been so dangerous, so pernicious. But I'm a realistic person. There are two states. There are sovereign independent states recognized in international law. So both have a right to exist as independent nations. Together then we can through the Sark Charter, go forward, uh, try to work for prosperity, for greater cooperation, and hopefully at the end of the day, we get something like the European Union. So that's how I see it. At the moment, I believe in the need for the current borders to be accepted by all, even the Kashmir one. Actually, this will do good to all. I've talked to many Kashmiris who say, sir, we know that this is the only thing which will work make the borders permanent, but easily accessible to both sides of Kashmiris. And we want that to happen in the Punjab as well, ultimately. So it all has to do with making the elites act responsibly. Otherwise, we face another disaster next summer or whatever, because this, you know, uh, uh, climate change is a fact and we have to act together in Pakistan and regionally. Thank you, Sarim, uh, thank you very much to all of you, to o OPPP, who are my very close friends and my three great colleagues who are with me here. Together, the four of us and all of us are worth millions, I know that. One can be a bit <laughs> celebrate. We should celebrate this also. Thank you so Dr. much. G, thank Dr. You. Pervez. I knew Ishtiaq from earlier. I also knew Rajmohan ji from earlier. This is the first time that I met Harsh ji, and I want to say how pleased I am to have met him. Apart from all the things that have been said by the three speakers in wrapping up, I'll say we share one other thing, which is we share the same genes. That genetic similarity between us is going to one day Maybe not in the next 50 years, maybe it'll take 200 years, who knows, but that is going to bring us together. Just consider one thing, in spite of CPEC, in spite of all the higher than the Himalayas and sweeter and deeper than the oceans and sweeter than honey, how close are China and Pakistan today? The answer is nowhere close. We have no cultural linkage with them, even though Chinese is being taught in Pakistani schools now, it's not being accepted as such. Nobody wants to learn Chinese except a few, few students. On the other hand, you see the cultural similarity between Pakistanis and Indians. You see that they look the same. They think in many ways in the same pattern. And that is the guarantee that one day there will be peace between India and Pakistan. Not now, 200 years later. So let's hope for that. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let me ask uh, Wahid Bhatti sahab to, to please present the conclusion of uh, this uh, 
dialogue yep. by putting up some, uh, some slides. Yep, I am going to do that. Uh, let me go to my best, uh, most favorite hobby share screen. Uh, okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, now I just, just it's, it's not just really a formality. I think it has been a wonderful session and I would like to really on behalf of OPP, thank you our four panelists and thank you all the participants for being so forthcoming and so open and candid about asking the questions and equally candid the responses from, uh, and, and I think it has been very educative, very informative, very stimulating and inspiring discussion. And we, we learned a lot from each other today. But just uh, based on what has been discussed, I would like to close it with the, with the uh, following remarks, uh, which in different ways, all everyone has said, all participants and the panelists. I think it's the fact we parted our ways 75 years ago. So let's not really live in history or live in the past. We, we take the past as it is, we learn from it, and we try to live in the future and not uh, go keep on going back. We both have reached adulthood and our big sovereign countries, that's uh, Shtyag Bhai said. Uh, okay, 75 years is, is a blink of an eye in the life of a nation, but it's long enough. It's really long enough to set a direction and to get the fundamentals right and get our intentions right. So despite all the bitterness of the past and present and the tragic events, they are really tragic. The hope is to live like good neighbors and work together for prosperity of both people. I think everyone has this latent and, and expressed and overt desire to literally do that. And I think this is wonderful to hear uh, what, what the people want and what the participants want. We both have our problems and a few shared ones. We are stuck in mutual suspicion and hostility, and we have to stop that. We are optimistic, but marked by poverty, corruption, extremism, intolerance, violence, social dysfunction even, uh, unequal treatment of women, uh, and take a few more points. But we also have made many marks in many fields, both Indians and both Pakistanis as people, they have, they have claimed their place internationally. So all is not uh, doom and gloom. Uh, there is a lot of nostalgia I heard on both sides. Uh, and then the, the Harishji, the story he told about his, uh, about his mother and, and visiting the house and how people reacted to that. You have a million stories like that. I mean, you go to internet, you sometimes, honestly, I maybe uh, I shouldn't be saying this, but I get so emotional and, and tears in my eyes even when I hear those kinds of stories. So it is hard to control emotions when we hear these heart-wrenching stories of from ordinary persons uh, who, who just went through it. And if we read the intellectuals, the writers, the musicians, if we read Manto, uh, read his uh, Toba Tek Singh or read his uh, Tanda Ghosh or we, we read Faiz Ahmad Faiz or Sair Ludhian, we listen to Gulzar or, or Sarab, Sarab Jot Singh Bail. I mean, I was watching his video when he was reciting Main Gujra Wala Chodaya. Honestly, it's very, very difficult to hold back your tears when you hear him talking about Gujra Wala. Uh, and then Gulzar Subha Subha Ek Khab Ki Dastak Par Darwaza Khola. And is in his beautiful voice when he recites this poem, it's very hard to believe that what's going on? I mean, what's, what's the difference between, between us as, uh, as Ishtiyag Bhai also said. So we have a rich and a long shared history in every faculty of life, maybe one exception that is religion. And it is now really time that we build a rich and long shared future. Uh, we might be, as, as uh, 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 many speakers said, that we really have to look forward and, and respect each other uh, and, and respect each other's uh, religious territory and so forth. Help each other where possible and stand aside where necessary. We don't have to keep on poking nose into everyone's internal affairs and, and tell everyone that we are superior, we know better what's good for you. No, stand aside when you have to. The choice is ours. Uh, so we have to really make a choice. So what is the choice? We can 
get stuck, stay stuck in the past, keep arguing who was right and who was wrong, was Jinnah right, was Jinnah wrong, was Gandhiji right, Gandhiji wrong. We can continue bitter discussions on what if. Ye hota to vesa hota to moti to kaisa hota. So we can continue that discussion and, and increase the bitterness. We can continue to magnify what divides us or an alternative is that respect and accept each other's sovereignty, define a shared future, shared future, work towards the prosperity of the people. Most importantly, get rid of the exploitative economic system, focus on education, healthcare, gender equality, human development, dot, dot, dot. We have a lot to do. So let's plant a tree together, what I said earlier, uh, so to plant a tree, you need good soil, you need seeds, you need fertilizer, and all the people sitting here today are all that. All we need to do is get the mix right and get on with it. And that was really the purpose of this meeting, uh, that, that uh, we, we sh share some solutions and, and, and try to share the future. And we have heard so many wonderful and good intentions uh, that it really gives you huge amount of hope. So I will come back to that where I started. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So uh, uh, let's, let's really do it. Now, before I close, this is my absolutely last slide, I promise, then I'll let you go. This is Ustad Daman. I know Hood Bhai, Hood Bhai Bhai, talked about Punjabi domination, but he happened to be a working class Punjabi uh, poet. Uh, and he said, he said a kita, four lines, which really sums up beautifully and so simply. And we have translated that in Hindi, English, and, and Urdu for, for people who uh, may or may not understand Punjabi. He says, Vage naal atari di nai takar na gita naal kurandi hai so the elite sitting up there, it's only about their profit and loss and rest is all details. So with this, uh, I would like to thank you all.